Order, please. We'll now begin with the daily routine, beginning with presenting and reading of petitions, presenting reports of committees, tabling reports, regulations, and other papers, statements by ministers, government notices of motion, the Honourable Minister of Labour and Advanced Education. Mr. Speaker, I'll be reading this notice of motion on behalf of the Premier. Mr. Speaker, I hereby give notice that on a future day I shall move the adoption of the following re resolution. Whereas today marks a day to tribute the late matron Jessie Brown Jagger, a nursing sister serving in the Canadian Army Corps during World War I and was one of 70 Canadian nurses to be stationed on the Greek island of Lemnos to treat the wounded and the sick Allied servicemen who fought during the Battle of Gallipoli. And whereas Matron Jagger was born in Wolfville, Kings County, Nova Scotia in 1873 to Elizabeth Whitten and John Lothrop Brown. And whereas the tomb of Matron Jesse Jagger is at the Portianos Military Cemetery and remains a visible reminder of her service and sacrifice and her passing while serving her country at war. Therefore, be it resolved that this House pay tribute to Matron Jesse Brown Jagger by honouring the devotion and courage that she displayed during the Great War. Mr. Speaker, I request waiver of notice and passage without debate. There has been a request for waiver. Is it agreed? agreed. It is agreed. Would all those in favour of the motion please say aye. aye. Contrary minded, nay. The motion is carried. The Honourable Minister of Education. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I hereby give notice that on a future day I shall move the adoption of the following resolution. Whereas next week from April 16th to 20th, we will celebrate Education Week, which recognizes the contributions made by administrators, teachers, and education staff to provide our students with a quality education. And whereas this year's theme, the entrepreneurial spirit, collaboration, critical thinking, innovation, and idea generation recognizes the work of educators and education partners in supporting the entrepreneurial mindset in students. And whereas we celebrate the work of our teachers and partners to provide our students with the competencies and skills to help our students with success, therefore be it resolved that all members of this House acknowledge the commitment and dedication of Nova Scotia's administrators, teachers, and education staff to foster the entrepreneurial mindset in our students and provide them with the best education possible. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker I ask for waiver of notice and passage without debate. There has been a request for waivers. Is it agreed? It is agreed. Would all those in favour of the motion please say aye. Aye. Contrary minded, nay. The motion is carried. The Honourable Minister of Justice. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. May I uh, request permission to make introductions? Permission granted. Mr. Speaker, joining us in the gallery today are a number of individuals from our Correctional Services team, and as I call her name, I'd ask them to stand. Mr. Chris Collett, Executive Director. Kathy Richards, Director. Paulette McKinnon, Director. Uh, Dan Ray, Senior Probation Officer. Amber McDowell as well, a senior probation officer. David Mills, manager of policy and programs. Tammy Vella, administrative assistant. Nadine Blair, administrative assistant. And Judith Crosby, uh, our occupational health and safety consultant. And I'd ask my colleagues in the house to bring them a warm welcome. The Honourable Minister of Justice. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I hereby give notice that on a future day I shall move the adoption of the following resolution. Whereas probation officers, youth workers, correctional officers, social workers, teachers, case management and program staff, support staff and managers play a vital role in the safety and security of our citizens and our communities, and whereas their work focuses on the successful rehabilitation, reintegration and supervision of youth and adults in custody and in the community, and whereas the work of all those who provide correctional programs and services is extremely challenging and their services deserve the respect, appreciation and recognition of this House and all of Nova Scotians, Therefore, be it resolved that we use this time together in the House to recognize the upcoming Correctional Services Week, May 13th to 19th, and thank the province's exceptional Correctional Services staff for making a positive impact in the correction system and facility, contributing to the safety of our communities. Mr. Speaker, I ask for waiver of notice and passage without debate. There has been a request for waivers. Is it agreed? It is agreed. Would all those in favour of the motion please say aye. Contrary minded, nay. The motion is carried. The Honourable Minister of Health and Wellness. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I hereby give notice that on a future day I shall move the adoption of the following resolution. 
Whereas access to important health and social services is made possible by the hard work of telecommunication operators across the province, and whereas in times of crisis these dedicated professionals remain calm and collected no matter how stressful the situation is, and whereas this week is National Public Safety Telecommunicators Week, a time to appreciate and thank the telecommunicators in this province who act as the first point of contact for Nova Scotians seeking help. Therefore, be it resolved that all members of this legislature recognize the important behind-the-scenes work telecommunicators do to make sure Nova Scotians get the help they need. Mr. Speaker, I ask for waiver of notice and passage without debate. There has been a request for waiver. Is it agreed? agreed. It is agreed. But all those in favour of the motion, please say aye. aye. Contrary-minded, nay. The motion is carried. We'll now move on to introduction of bills. The Honourable Member for Kings North. Mr. Speaker, I beg leave to introduce a bill entitled An Act to Support People with Disabilities. The Honourable Member for Kings North begs leave to introduce a bill entitled An Act to Support People with Disabilities. Bill number 123, entitled An Act to Support People with Disabilities. Ordered that the bill be read a second time on a future day. We'll now move on to notices of motion. Statements by members. The Honourable Member for Argyle Barrington. Thank you very much. It is on behalf of the Member for Pick to West. Uh, Mr. Speaker, today I rise to provide an update on upgrades being made to complete a new portion of the 4-H barn currently under construction at the Pick to North Colchester Exhibition Grounds. Bonnie Allen and Ruby McKenzie, co-chair of the fundraising committee, which has raised over $142,000 in monetary and in-kind donations. This group is looking to raise an additional $40,000 to finish the entire building by enhancing the older section. The floor and outside steel of the barn needs to be replaced. This new 4-H building will be used more often by groups that have previously gathered elsewhere for meetings, workshops and other events. Mr. Speaker, I am so proud of the community coming together for this worthy cause as well as the volunteers through 4-H that are making this a reality. Thank you very much. The Honourable Member for Clayton Park West. Mr. Speaker, I want to recognize a passionate young woman who is helping build friendship at her school. Grace Morrison is the executive liaison to the Best Buddies and Inclusion Committees at Halifax West High School. On Wednesdays, Grace organizes a time for students to make crafts with the students from the Learning Center. And on Fridays, they all wear jerseys and play together in the gym. There is no doubt that lasting bonds are created through these activities and Grace loves to see friendships that unfold. Mr. Speaker, I ask that the members of this House of Assembly join me in thanking Grace for fostering friendship at her schools. She is doing a great job. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Queen's Shelburne. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I rise today to applaud 14-year-old Autumn Carver, who already has a country music career that will be the envy of many adults. Autumn is a talented musician and songwriter from Middlefield, Queen's County, whose goal is to be in Nashville singing and writing country music. She won the 2017 Social Idol Contest, sharing the stage with Terry Clark, and also sang, sang at the annual Hank Snow Tribute Festival in Liverpool. This June 15th, she will star as a special guest to warm up the audience at Queen's Place in Liverpool for Jason Benoit, who is opening the concert for CCMA winner, the Union, Washboard Union. Mr. Speaker, I congratulate Autumn on her musical achievements to date. With her talent, dedication and determination, I know she'll go far. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Yarmouth. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. On April 8th, in front of a sold-out hometown crowd at Yarmouth Mariner Centre, the Yarmouth Junior A Mariners won the Maritime Hockey League East Link South Division Championship after winning Game 5 by a score of 4-2 over the South Shore Lumberjacks. I'd like to ask this House to join me in congratulating the Yarmouth Junior A Mariners team, Campbell Balk, Matt Barron, Kyle Berg, 
Caleb Boudreaux, Brent Broders, Ben Shipman, Patrick Daly, Keegan Gauthier, Chris Gorham, Leif Hertz, Derek Johnson, Lockie McDonald, Aaron Maillet, Andrew Martel, Duncan Mackay, Noah McMullen, Connor Peverell, Thompson Finney, Adam Pilot, Luke Poirier, Matt Smith, Logan Timmons, and Brendan Young, head coach Lori Barron, assistant coaches Kyle Boudreau, David Letticote, and John Murphy, athletic therapist Tessa, Churchill Morehouse, head equipment manager Ed Coffin, assistant equipment manager Randy Muse, and team owners Mitch Bonner and Keith Condon. Let's wish the Junior A Mariners team and organization the best of luck in the upcoming Maritime Hockey League final. They have all made their community very proud. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Cumberland North. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to recognize Sheldon Morris of Spring Hill. <clears throat> he will be the only representative from Cumberland County participating in the Boston Marathon. This will be his fifth time running in the marathon and representing his home. Sheldon is hoping to finish in under three and a half hours. He has persevered through previous marathons and some minor injuries. We are proud to have a resident of Cumberland County represent us at the Boston Marathon later this month. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Member for Bedford. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I want to congratulate the many people throughout Nova Scotia who work in the tourism industry. Last year, tourism saw a 7% increase in revenue to $2.7 billion. We had 2.4 million visitors, up 9%, with big increases in tourists from Ontario, up 16%, Western Canada, up 19%, and the U.S. and overseas, both up over 10%. Our cruise ship traffic to Halifax rose 23%, while in Cape Breton it was up a whopping 42%. Mr. Speaker, I have no doubt much of the increase is due to the warm reception Nova Scotians give tourists. I, I first visited Nova Scotia in the fall of 1984, and I fell in love with this province, its warm people, and its wonderful vistas, and I've been here ever since. Mr. Speaker, Nova Scotia is well on its way to meeting the goal of doubling our revenue derived from tourism, and I want to thank those who work in this industry for their hard work in growing the industry. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Dartmouth East. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I'm happy to uh, recognize the upcoming Shuby Classic 5K Fun Run. Running in Shuby Park has long been one of my favorite parts about living in Dartmouth, and I'm pleased when I see other people using the park. The 5K Fun Run partners with local sponsors to host a great event, but I'm most proud of their partnership with the Mental Health Foundation of Nova Scotia. Spreading awareness and encouraging conversations around mental health while promoting a healthy, active lifestyle have always been priorities of mine, and I am reassured to see these priorities shared at this event. Mr. Speaker, I'm very proud to have this awesome event in Dartmouth East, and I ask all members of this House to wish the runners well in their race. Now we just hope that the weather works in our favour. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Colchester North. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. <clears throat> Mr. Speaker, thanks to numerous fundraisers and donations, the John K. McDonald Memorial Sports Park in Tadema Gush continues to, continues to be a hub of activity. The park is cared for by volunteers and is of frequent use. During the school months, the school students utilize the park uh, with the North Shore Recreation Center programming taking advantage of the park from June through to September. The sports park is used for soccer, ball, and has a walking and running track used by all ages. Mr. Speaker, Tad McGushin area is a very active community and outdoor facilities like this memorial park are assets they truly enjoy. The Honourable Member for Picto Centre. Uh, Mr. Speaker, when Noah Dignan moved with his family to Canada from his birthplace of Scotland at age three, he could have done what many Canadian kids do, play hockey. However, soccer was his passion. This very talented player began kicking soccer balls around before he learned to walk. The New Glasgow resident joined North Nova United at age eight and immediately reached a top competitive level for his age playing Tier 1 for XFC Under-12 Boys, based out of St. Francis Xavier University. Presently, 14-year-old Noah is training with the best young soccer players in the province. Hopefully, hopefully Noah will fulfill his dream, that is, playing pro soccer. We wish him great success in his pursuit. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Anaganish. Mr. Speaker, I rise today to pay tribute to a wonderful woman and one of the founders of X Project, Joan Dillon. 
X Project is a student society at St. of X where students volunteer to provide education, recreation and leadership programs to African Nova Scotian and Mi'kmaq youth in five neighboring communities. In its 53 year history, X Project has had more than 4,000 student volunteers and has worked with over 1,000 children. Mr. Speaker, Joan's commitment to X Project knew no bounds. However, X Project is just one part of Joan's legacy. She was also a scout leader for 35 years, leading cup packs from Anakinish and in all of the X Project communities. She was given the Silver Acorn Award for her dedication to scouts, inducted into the African Canadian Heritage and Friendship Centre in Guysboro, inducted into the Hall of Thoughts, and received a Canada 125 medal. Joan received the Order of Nova Scotia, an honorary X ring, and an honorary Doctorate of Laws from <coughs> St. of X, and too many community awards to count, including a road being named after her. Mr. Speaker, it would be impossible to measure the role Joan played in the lives of so many. She loved to help others, and her absence will be deeply felt in our community. The Honourable Member for Cumberland North. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to recognize Gary Trask of Spring Hill. He has over 30 years of service with the Golden Opportunities Vocational Rehabilitation Centre. Gary has worked in the centre's woodshop for those with disabilities. He will be retiring this week after three decades of work. His supervisors and co-workers recognize that he was one of the hardest workers and will be greatly missed. They will continue to work after he's gone, but the place will not be the same without Gary. It's a pleasure to congratulate Gary Trask on his retirement, and we wish him well in this next chapter of his life. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Preston Dartmouth. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to rec recognize Denisha Provo as she is part, part of Canada's women's basketball team for the Commonwealth Games. She was Canada's second leading scorer in the basketball game with Australia at the Commonwealth Games. She had 13 points, four rebounds, all on the offensive glass, and was perfect six for six on the foul line. She shot 43% from the floor. Provo, a six-foot wing from the University of Utah Utes, has been among leaders in minutes played for both Canada's games down under. Steve Barr, head coach, expects Provo to play a big role for Team Canada, having already shown she can defend a small forward position at an international level. I applaud and congratulate Denisha Provo on her many successes at the University of Utah and at the Commonwealth Games. The Honourable Member for Queen's Shelburne. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I rise today to congratulate a talented team of young basketball players from Shelburne. The Shelburne Thrashers won gold medals at Basketball Nova Scotia's Under-12 Championship held in Cambridge from March 23rd to the 25th. The team went undefeated in the two-division tournament, defeating the Bedford Eagles 42-33 in the final. The team's coach, Mike Shan, praised the boys for their teamwork, sportsmanship, respect, attitudes, and noted that they displayed qualities and characters that go beyond the scope of coaching. Mr. Speaker, I applaud both the team and their coach on this achievement, their dedication, and commitment to sport. They should be very proud of this accomplishment. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Dartmouth North. Mr. Speaker, later this morning, tenants, housing activists and supporters will gather outside an apartment building in Dartmouth to protest the unsafe and unhealthy conditions of the rental units inside. Tenants report that there are cockroaches, broken elevators, roof leaks, window leaks, toilet leaks, no water and many other issues in the building. Though the gathering will be focusing on one particular building in Dartmouth, we know that there are sim similar situations in units all across the HRM and the province. Mr. Speaker, every single person deserves safe, affordable and healthy housing options for themselves and their families. It's unacceptable when large corporations come in, buy up apartment buildings, jack up rents and then leave tenants struggling to get basic repairs done. We must ensure that regulations are in place to protect tenants from these situations. I want to take a moment to acknowledge the tenants' rights organization ACORN for the amazing amazing work it does in mobilizing and education, educating tenants about their rights, and I encourage all members to work so that all Nova Scotians are housed in safe, clean, healthy and affordable housing. The Honourable Member for Hans East. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. 
Today I'd like to recognize a young man who has a true passion for his community, or our community really, and has turned that into a career serving as a journalist for our local newspaper. Pat Healy has been with the Weekly Press since 2008, and in the words of his editor, Pat takes his love of community journalism to the level that's unrivaled in the field. He doesn't just report the news in East Hans and surrounding areas, he goes above and beyond to understand, to participate, and to care. Pat continually puts in long hours to ensure he gets the best coverage even when it's not asked of him. He has a genuine tie to all the communities and knows many by many people by their first name. He knows uh, who's up and coming in sports, he values the volunteers that give tirelessly, and he understands the importance of reporting the tough news as it's breaking. I ask all members of this house to, to join me in thanking Pat Healy for his contribution and dedication to our community. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Coal Harbour Eastern Passage. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Today I would like to bring recognition to the new Caldwell Health Centre, a new business in the Coal Harbour Eastern Passage constituency. Owners Megan Cavanaugh, a physiotherapist, and Krista Murray, a re registered massage therapist, are happy to offer our community a health centre offering physiotherapy, acupuncture, and massage therapy. The centre strives to accommodate as many people as possible with extended hours and customised treatment plans. Megan and Krista are so proud to ensure integrity, informative, and warm visits with all staff and clients. Reaching goals as broad as their clients is something all staff are striving for and will continue to reach higher and higher, continually growing new goals. Thank you for all that they are able to do for our community and I ask everyone in the legislature to join me in congratulating this new business. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Claire Digby. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Again, this year we honour the volunteers, including the following three chosen to represent their communities at our provincial ceremony. Robert Gadet of the Municipality of Digby has for the past 25 years volunteered at the Weymouth Kiwanis Club, the Weymouth Fire Department and the, and the Canada Day celebrations, to name a few. He still finds time to help assemble the playground equipment at the local cricket field. Roland Camo of Clare has for the last 50 years been involved in many organizations, from the Nova Scotia Kidney Foundation and the local food bank to the Lions Club. An avid golfer, he chairs the local committee for the Atlantic Futures Lynx Golf Tournament. And finally, Pat Potts of Digby has for the last 60 years been involved with the Association of the Digby Ladies Curling Club, Christmas Daddies, as well as the organizers of local festivities. Her service included terms as president of the Atlantic Ladies Golf Association and on town council. I am particularly proud of this last volunteer of the year who inspired in her children the need to give back to their community. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Cape Breton Richmond. Mr. Speaker, volunteers devote their time, energy, and often their financial resources to support their communities and individuals in need. Volunteers help to provide programs, services, and activities otherwise not available to them. Mr. Speaker, over the years, hundreds of volunteers have been recognized throughout the municipal units incorporated in Cape Breton Richmond. Each year, some of these volunteers have gone on to be recognized provincially at the annual ceremony. Mr. Speaker, in addition to sending my congratulations to to all of the recognized volunteers in the constituency. I would like to highlight this year's three provincially recognized volunteers. Kelly McIntyre Hayes, representing the town of Port Hawkesbury, as well as Debbie Sanson and Lori Doucette, representing the municipality of the County of Richmond and the Boudledeg First Nation. Mr. Speaker, these dedicated volunteers deserve recognition in this house, and I take this opportunity to thank them, along with all volunteers in Cape Breton, Richmond. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. <coughs> The Honourable Member for Guysboro Eastern Shore, Trackety. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I would like to congratulate Heather Brophy Brennan on receiving her 10-year service award from the town of Mulgrave. Heather is the Recreation and Physical Activity Coordinator for the community, but her enthusiastic efforts far outreach the expectation of her job description. Along with her jam-packed recreation schedule of youth, family, and senior programming, she also manages to find time to coach volleyball, organize a Mulgrave school reunion, lend a hand with Scotia Day's activities, and race for a cure for multiple cirrhosis. Mr. Speaker, the town of Mulgrave is a vibrant community that is only made brighter still by Heather Brennan's warm personality and creative ideas that inspire people to participate in social outings and active living. She excels at her vocation and her many volunteer efforts, and I stand today to join the town of Mulgrave in thanking Heather for her unwavering leadership and community spirit. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. 
The Honourable Member for Colchester, Muscadabit Valley. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Mr. Speaker, Team Nova Scotia was well represented this past weekend at the Canadian Masters Women's Curling Championship in White Rock, BC. Calling Peatonese Reek squeaked past Team Ontario to win the bronze. After finishing first in the championship round robin, they lost to Saskatchewan in the semi final. The medal winning foursome consists of Colleen Peatney Skip, Mark Cutcliffe, third, Karen Henniger, second, Susan Creelman, lead. I wish to extend congratulations to all four members of the Colleen Peatney Toro Rink on bringing home the bronze medal at the Canadian Masters. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Halifax, Armdale. Mr. Speaker, I want to recognize the Metro West Force Blue Bantam AA girls hockey team who on March 25th at the Apple Dome in Berwick topped the Fundy Highland Subway Select 3-1 and were crowned provincial champions. With this goal, they finished that weekend's tournament with a perfect 5-0 record and notched their association its second provincial title of the year. The team is made up of talented girls from Halifax to Sackville and includes a number of players from the Armdale area. Last weekend, the Metro West Force girls represented Nova Scotia at the female Bantam Atlantic Championships in Charlottetown. Winning four of the five games they played, they won the tournament with an impressive 4-1 four victory over the Mid-Isle Wildcats. Armdale's own Jillian Duggan, a forward on the team, was named tournament MVP and was the top scorer. Her teammate Lucy Phillips was top tournament goalie. I want to congratulate the Metro West girls on their win and wish them the best. The Honourable Member for Cole Harbour Eastern Passage. Mr. Speaker, today I rise to bring attention to the House of the kindness and generosity of Ms. Tanya Noggle, the owner and operator of the Eastern Passage Seafarers Pub. Over the Easter weekend, Tanya and her Easter bunnies, including myself, hosted a free Easter dinner for the seniors from Island View Manor. Tanya did the same thing at Christmas time, and it's my understanding that at special events in the future, we will also be doing the same thing. Tanya has gone out of her way since she opened up her pub a year ago to support the seniors of our community, and I want all of the members of the House to join me in thanking her for her kindness. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Timberley Prospect. Mr. Speaker, I would like to recognize Bob Chalk, a Halifax writer and historian who has a passion for the ocean around Canada's Atlantic coast. As a scuba diver, Bob has visited the site of many wrecks, one of his favourite being the SS Atlantic, a steamship that sank off Lower Prospect on April 1, 1873, taking with it more than 500 lives. Bob sits on the board of directors for the SS Atlantic Heritage Park Society, a non-profit organization whose intentions are to preserve the resting place of 277 victims of the sinking. Bob is a natural storyteller. He weaves together the historic tales of how bad weather, bad navigation, and bad luck have resulted in the tragic losses of ships and people, bringing the stories alive. Through his extensive research, Bob has tracked down many descendants of the heroic rescuers, as well as some of the descendants of victims and survivors of this great tragedy. I would like the members of the Nova Scotia House of Assembly to join me in thanking Bob for his tireless dedication to preserving and telling these stories of tragedy and heroism that have shaped our coastal communities. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Sydney Whitney Pier. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I was uh, I was excited to learn this week that uh, Sydney resident Aaron Lewis has been inducted into the Nova Scotia Country Music Hall of Fame. Uh, Aaron Lewis has performed and shared the stage with some of the, some of the greatest artists uh, in the industry, including Alabama, Tommy Hunter, the Osmonds, Prairie, or Prairie Oyster, and Charlie Pride. Uh, he moved back to Cape Breton to marry the love of his life and uh, continued to perform across the island with great artists, including Matt Minglewood, Gordy Sampson, and John Allen Cameron. Mr. Speaker, I can say that uh, Aaron is an amazing performer, but he's a really great guy, and I'm honored to stand in my place today as the MLA in the community, and I ask all members of this host to congratulate congratulate Aaron on uh, his success uh, and his induction into the Nova Scotia Country Music Hall of Fame. The Honourable Member for Waverly Fall River Beaverbank. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I'm pleased today to congratulate Duncan Robertson of Fall River on being accepted to the uh, Federal 2018 Liberal Inter Internship Program. 
Duncan is currently a student at the University of Toronto majoring in history and political science. Uh, his internship uh, runs from April 30th to August the 24th and will provide hard-working students with an experience in areas such as communications, media relations, local field and outreach, financial and accounting, and many others. Duncan volunteered much of his time last May working for my campaign in Waverly Fall River Beaver Bank, and I saw firsthand his uh, professionalism and dedications. Mr. Speaker, I would like uh, to wish Duncan all the best in his summer position and his future as, a, uh, as he completes his education. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Argyle Barrington. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Uh, again, do this on behalf of the member for Pictou West. Uh, Mr. Speaker, the Rotary Club of Pictou, uh, Pictou, I'll get this right if I'm doing it for her, uh, will be celebrating their 75th anniversary this summer. Along with this momentous milestone, they will also be honouring a dear friend and mentor, Art McDonald, who has been a Rotarian for the past 50 years. Art was instrumental in the development of the club's now well-known annual musical at the Dukas Centre, which raises funds for many local groups such as 4-H and the Hector Arena, and assists students from Pictou with funding for school trips. Art is a testament to the, world volunteer, the word volunteer and a gentleman. He has many careers in his life, from teaching to being a familiar face at the Pictou Sears, from which he recently retired. I'd like to thank Art and the Rotary Club of Pictou for such a long period of giving to the community. The Honourable Member for Dartmouth North. Mr. Speaker, I would like to recognize an inspiring young woman from Dartmouth North, Kaylee Dixon. Kaylee could be honored for many reasons, but today I want to draw attention to her Random Acts of Kindness project. Kaylee has offered up her beautiful and fashionable grade nine prom dress to someone who will do 10 uh, random acts of kindness in our community and who will document their acts with photos or videos. Examples that Kaylee cites are buying someone coffee, creating positive notes and handing them out at school, volunteering at a soup kitchen, uh, garbage pickup, to name just a few ideas. After the April 25th deadline, Kaylee will choose the person she thinks has made the greatest impact and that person will be awarded this beautiful dress. If it doesn't fit, then she will offer money towards the person's own dress and uh, pass the dress on to someone else. Kaylee is a student at Dartmouth High School and an active member of the Dartmouth North community. I ask the House to join me in thanking her for her innovative and generous action to encourage much needed kindness in our community. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Halifax Atlantic. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I would like to take a moment to recognize an outstanding Nova Scotian, Mr. Rodney Small. As a youth and young man, Rodney overcame poverty, crime, and racism. Rodney was raised by his grandmother in public housing. His youth took him down many rough paths, including time in Waterville. Rodney faced blatant racism while working at HRM and launched a complaint with the Nova Scotian Human Rights Commission. You would think, Mr. Speaker, that all these obstacles would stop Rodney but no, it motivated him. Rodney earned a management degree from Dalhousie. He now works for Common Good Solutions as a uh, community builder and helps build social enterprises. Though he said he will always call Uniac Square home, Rodney now lives in beautiful Herring Cove. He's a true inspiration for all. My only question of Rodney is, who will portray him when a movie is made about his life? What a role model. The Honourable Member for Chester St. Margaret's. Mr. Speaker, I rise today to read a statement shared with me by the Chester Minor Hockey Association, whose Chester Ravens jersey I wore today, yesterday. Mr. Speaker, in the wake of the Humboldt Broncos tragedy, my staff and I joined the Chester Minor Hockey Association to send our sincere condolences to all those involved. Chester Minor Hockey Association and all the residents of Chester St. Margaret's extend condolences to the community of Humboldt and to say that our hearts are with you during this time of need. Chester Minor Hockey will make a donation to the Humboldt Brocos Fund and encourage all minor hockey associations in the province to do the same. Throughout the municipality of Chester, hockey sticks have been placed outside our front doors to pay respect to those lost and to those recovering. Yesterday, players from Chester Minor Hockey paid their respects to the Humboldt Broncos team members by wearing their jerseys to school. Thank you, Mr. Speaker.
The Honourable Member for Lunenburg. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, I rise today to recognize Michael O'Connor, the recipient of the 2018 Provincial Volunteer Award for the Town of Mahone Bay. Michael is a former mathematics teacher and principal of the Mahone Bay School and continues to offer tutoring services to students for free. He is an initiator and active board member for the Lunenburg County Community Fund, which focuses on sustaining and growing, growing the quality of life in Lunenburg. Michael has been a 25-year member of the Mahone Bay Legion Band as a musician, director, and organizer of performances. Michael was highly involved in the planning of the Mahone Bay Bandstand for the town. He has been involved with the Mahone Bay Museum for the past 25 years as chair, board member, and helping the museum with everyday maintenance. He remains connected to Trinity United Church, being both a trustee and choir member. Mr. Speaker, I would ask that you and members of this House of Assembly please join me in thanking Michael O'Connor for his many years of volunteering in the town of Mahone Bay and congratulate him on receiving this Provincial Volunteer Award. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Halifax Citadel Sable Island on an introduction. Mr. Speaker, permission to make an introduction. Joining us today in the East Gallery, Mr. Speaker, and I'd ask her to stand, uh, Nas Suwanamporn is here from Thailand. She's a grade 11 student at Armbray Academy. She has uh, come to Nova Scotia for a full year of school, and uh, today she is coming to the legislature, actually part of her study. She's job shadowing a government member for the morning, and she is here to see the workings of the House and to learn more about international governments, and I'd like to extend her the warm welcome of the House. The Honourable Member for Clayton Park West. Mr. Speaker, I would like to congratulate the Halifax West High School high school boys soccer team on their recent Division I championship win. The Halifax West Warriors defeated the Citadel Phoenix 4-1. to in, <laughs> in the Nova Scotia School uh, Athletic Federation tournament at Mainland Common, Abdullah Nimr led the Warriors with two goals and Rani Rahmani and Ayyub Al-Arab had one each. Uh, Al-Arabi, sorry. Uh, this is the third straight championship for the Warriors. Mr. Speaker, I ask that the members of this House of Assembly join me in applauding these talented young men for their hard work on the field. Way to go, Warriors. The Honourable Member for King South. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I rise today to bring to your attention the con a continuing initiative by dentist Dr. Aaron Hennessy of Wolfville, based on a previous AVDS Cares Henry Shrine Dental Day. Her concerns for negative health consequences for those that can't afford dental care prompted her and her team to offer a free day of dental attention recently in Wolfville. She was joined by a group of 14 caring volunteers, including five dentists, three dental assistants, three dental hygienists, and two technicians. There's hope that this project will grow and there will be more dentists, volunteers, and patients involved each year. We thank generous and caring community-minded professionals like Dr. Hennessy, who helped provide important services to Nova Scotians in need. I ask all members of the House of Assembly and join, join me in thanking Dr. Aaron Hennessy. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Kings West. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I rise today to recognize Kings West resident Patricia McNair, who recently hosted the World Drum of Peace at Province House. The World Drum of Peace has traveled around the world for many years, uh, visiting over 80 countries uh, and in 700 locations, carrying forth a simple message that of peace, unity, and cooperation across all cultures. The drum arrived at Province House for a reception with elders from Indigenous communities and young children in attendance. Minister, uh, Minister uh, uh, of, uh, of uh, African Affairs was kind enough to participate and lend his drumming talents to the event. All who attended will remember Patricia and Pat's grandson who contributed to the event in his youthful manner. As a member of the Legislative Assembly for Kings West, I would like to thank Patricia McNair for bringing the world drum of peace to Province House and for sharing her words about the importance of peace in our world. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Anaganish. 
In 2016, Tony's Meats was recognized by the Anakinish Chamber of Commerce for its ability to expand into markets outside of Nova Scotia. They received the Export Recognition Award. Mr. Speaker, I'm proud to say Tony's Meats continues to expand and to enter new markets. Tony's Meats recently announced a new, exciting retail partner, Walmart Canada. Their heat and serve wraps are available in Walmart stores across Nova Scotia, New Brunswick, Prince Edward Island, Newfoundland, and Ontario. Tony's Meats has been a major employer for the Anakinish region since its opening in 1963. In 2013, it became the first federally inspected meat processing facility in Nova Scotia to achieve safe quality food certification under the Global Food Safety Initiative. Mr. Speaker, Tony's Meats and their associated brands continue to expand and show incredible growth. This new partnership with Walmart means even more potential. Mr. Speaker, I ask my fellow colleagues in the House of Assembly to join me in congratulating Tony's Meats on their new retail opportunity and wish them the best in their future endeavours. The Honourable Member for Clare Digby. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Over the years, I have risen to congratulate the Town of Digby, its organizations and residents, and their continuing efforts to make their community a better place to live and a nicer place to visit. This includes organizations such as the events of Wharf Rat Rally and the Digby Scallop Days, the building of the Digby BMX Skating Park, and returning the Digby Pier Lighthouse to its place of prominence at the waterfront. Digby is a lovely historical community on the Annapolis Basin, a community often listed as the places to visit. The town is now considering implementing a downtown facade program to continue their efforts to spruce up the town. The initial meetings have involved town officials, community leaders and artists, all discussing ways to improve their beautiful town. They have covered the possibility of adding green spaces and murals to the town and having a facade program for the Darius buildings. If they decide to go forward, they will eventually complete a multi-year plan to improve the community. To these efforts, I encourage the group and I can't wait to see the results. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Halifax Armdale. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I'm pleased today to recognize a notable constituent of Halifax, Armdale, Tanya Conrad. Tanya is the mother of three beautiful girls and leads a very active lifestyle. She's a kinesiology graduate and a certified professional fitness and lifestyle consultant. Her work has seen her performing fitness testing, functional capacity evaluations, and personal training from one corner of the country to the other. After obtaining her diploma and Pedortics, Tanya began her present career as a certified pedortist working with Biotech Orthotic Design Inc. Her keen grasp of orthotics and balance issues not only helps her clients but comes in handy in her role as a dance and jujutsu mom. Tanya also serves as the president of the Shabakta Heights Elementary School Advisory Council. I want to thank <coughs> Tanya for taking on this important leadership role in my community. I'm looking forward to working closely with her and the team at the SAC in the coming months and years. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Pictou East. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, this week the Deputy Chief of the Hansport Fire Department told the Municipality of West Hans that their fire station is overcrowded and there's limited space for firefighters to dress before getting on the truck and responding to calls. As well, they're having trucks manufactured to fit into the existing buildings as opposed to ordering trucks that will do the best job that's required at the fire scenes. Mr. Speaker, I urge the, the Department of Municipal Affairs to work with the department to try and find some capital funding that would allow them to build a small center where they could host some meals and do some other fundraising activities as they try to continue to work with the Municipality of, East, of West Hans to uh, figure out some alternatives going forward. Mr. Speaker, the Hansport Fire Station is literally out of space, and for safety reasons, I'm asking the, the Minister of Municipal Affairs to try to work with the department to try to solve the problem and support our firefighters. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Waverly Fall River Beaver Bank. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, Nova Scotia is very proud of our Olympic uh, gymnast, Ellie Black. This phenomenal young athlete has just completed in the Commonwealth Games where she earned two gold medals. Students at George P. Vanier in Fall River uh, were treated to a visit from Ellie in December. She spoke of, uh, to the students and about the journey to, to, her, to where she is today <coughs> and how hard work will help you reach your goals. It was only, uh, 
It was not only the aspiring gymnasts in the audience that were impressed with Ellie's message, but all students were moved by her passion. Thank you, Ellie, for sharing your experience and inspiring the students of our community. Much appreciated. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Halifax Citadel, Sable Island. Mr. Speaker, for the second year in a row, a group of St. Mary's students have won the top prize for Nova Scotia's Provincial Open Data Challenge. Students Danielle Arantes, Rodolfo Garia, Mohamed Hamid, Jennifer LaPlante, and Duane Malone took the top prize from 16 other competitors. The winning app that the team created used data from immigration and population statistics to create a program allowing for new Nova Scotians to network and meet based on similar interests. Congratulations to this team. We wish you all great success in the future. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Halifax Atlantic. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I'd like to recognize an outstanding business in my community, Station 6. Though barely a year old, Station 6 has become a go-to place in our community with great service, food and drink. Mr. Speaker, during Burger Week, Station 6 served up the very tasty Bergen, Bourbon Legend, which raised $3,020 for Feed Nova Scotia, and that translates into 4,530 <coughs> meals for Nova Scotians in need. Thank you to the staff and owners of Station 6 for believing and investing in our community. Here's to many more years of success. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Hans West. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to recognize National Public Safety Telecommunication, Telecommunicators Week, April 8th to 14th. Nova Scotia RCMP is recognizing the vital role of dispatchers as a key lifeline in times of need. Dispatchers answered 93,557 calls related to 911 emergencies in 2017 in Nova Scotia. Dispatchers are on the other end of the line as someone could be experiencing the worst moments of their life, says Inspector Bill Long, officer in charge of Nova Scotia RCMP OCC. They are a calm voice during a crisis, a lifeline for those in need, and a fundamental part of public oper police, op police operations. The dispatchers are the frontline support for our first responders 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. These supporters of our frontline workers make quick, high stakes decisions to ensure that members of the public get the help they need in time of an emergency. I applaud and congratulate the dispatchers on the key role they play in helping to keep all Nova Scotians safe. The Honourable Member for Chester St. Margaret's. Mr. Speaker, I would like to recognize the St. Margaret's Bay Stewardship Association, Bay Rides, Rails to Trails, the Bay Seniors Association, and the Bay Treasure Chest, each of which is a dynamic local nonprofit who joined together to create the St. Margaret's Bay Community Enterprise Centre. This new initiative was born from reflections on the Ivany Report and how community can improve their own economic and social well-being. Located at the site of the old Mariposa Market in the Redmond Shopping Centre, Upper Tantallon, the centre opened its doors to the public on April 3rd with their grand opening set for April 26th. The centre will be open Monday to Fridays from 9 to 4 p.m. and will provide offices and a forum where service groups, volunteer organisations and local businesses can work, meet and share ideas. The entrepreneurial hub will provide networking and other resources to the existing and emerging small business community in the St. Margaret's Bay region. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Halifax Citadel, Sable Island. Mr. Speaker, I would like to recognize the recent recipients of the 2018 Dalhousie Governor's Awards. Yasser Al-Kayel, Leah Carrier, Jeremy Stroud, Martha Painter, and Jad Sino all received this prestigious award. The nominees are selected by peers at Dalhousie and chosen by a committee made up of the President, Board, and Vice Provost. This year, the winners spanned across the academic field from nursing, international business, computer science, and psychiatry. Please join me in congratulating these students, and we wish them all the best in their bright future. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. In the absence of no more member statements, I'll just take a second to remind members that the member statements is not to be used for presenting verbatim remarks of individuals or groups, uh, verbatim statements uh, on community groups, etc. So it's a good chance, while well, we have a few minutes, to familiarize yourself with the rules, which as I mentioned, I think yesterday, hopefully are all right handy at your fingertips in your desk. The House will now recess for a few minutes while we wait the beginning of oral questions.
Order, please. We'll now move on to oral questions put by members to ministers. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. Mr. Speaker, over the two days that we've now been fully aware of the Foy Pop breach, one thing has been clear. The messaging from this government has been to talk first and fact check later. With regards to the breach, the Premier said on Wednesday, and I quote, we felt there was technical issues on the site, which we brought it down and immediately contacted law enforcement. Immediately contacted law enforcement. By the government's own timeline, Mr. Speaker, the site was taken down on April 5th at 8.15 a.m. The police were notified on April 7th at 9 p.m. Did the Premier choose these words because immediately sounds more decisive than 60 hours later and after a conversation with her lawyer? The Honourable Premier. No, no uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Mr. Speaker, we've identified that by one of our own employees uh, that there was a breach into the site, Mr. Speaker. Uh, the minister and her department uh, went through that site to ensure where there's, where, there, where there's an actual breach outside of government. We discovered there was a breach outside of government. When we identified that breach that happened outside of government, the police were called. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. Over 60 hours later. Yesterday, the Premier was asked about an inconsistency in what police may or may not have told the province regarding disclosing this breach to the public. He said, and I quote, our security team was talking to the Halifax Police Department. I don't know what the conversation was about, but through those conversations, that was how they ended up with the advice, I guess. The advice he was referring to was to stay silent. The Premier claims to not know what the conversation was about, but knows that it was about the advice to stay silent. How is the Premier able to simultaneously know and not know about the content of a meeting? The Honourable Premier. Mr. Speaker, uh, it comes as a surprise to the Honourable Member, Mr. Speaker, but uh, there were conversations between our security team of uh, the department uh, with Halifax Regional Police. It is a common practice, Mr. Speaker, when someone reports a crime to the police, that the police come in communication with the people who reported the crime. They've continued over that period of time, back and forth in conversation. As I said on the very first day, that, is, that they at no time told us not to report that information. What we said back and forth in that conversation, the more time that they could have access to execute the law, Mr. Speaker, to ensure they got a hold of that hard drive, would ensure that would be no damage done to that, Mr. Speaker. The fact of the matter is, and the, Mr. Speaker, the fact of the matter is, the host leader of the opposition party is asking about the chief of staff. At no time did my chief of staff be involved in this. The minister responsible for this file, Mr. Speaker, I have tremendous confidence in him. If the minister wants to undermine the confidence of this member and this minister, stand on his feet and stand on his feet and accuse her, Mr. Speaker. But I want to tell you, Mr. Speaker, I have all the confidence in this minister, her department, and we've got to the bottom of this. Leader of the official opposition. The Premier said here yesterday, we know our portal was breached once. The department has since come forward and said they don't know if there are more breaches because they haven't completed their review on the logs. And again, the Premier states empathetically things that are later determined to be inaccurate or at least not re representative of the full facts. Mr. Speaker, I believe the Premier is desperate to make this go away. When will the Premier realize that he needs to stop compounding his mistakes and tell the people that there was a vulnerability in the system for more than a year and that he doesn't know how many breaches there actually were and how much more information might be out there. The Honourable Premier. Mr. Speaker, I want to assure the Honourable Member, Mr. Speaker, we know there was a breach, Mr. Speaker. It's why we took the time to call the Halifax Regional Police, Mr. Speaker, to go and execute the legal parts of the law to ensure that we got a hold of that hard drive to find out where that information has gone, whether it has left the hard drive and gone anywhere else, and we will know whether or not that information has been sent to an other individuals or groups of individuals, Mr. Speaker. We're going to continue to make sure not only do we follow the law in this province, but we continue to move this province forward. We're seeing youth, young unemployment dropping, Mr. Speaker. We're seeing more young people stay in this province, Mr. Speaker. We're seeing our exports grow. We're seeing pre-primary being delivered across our province, Mr. Speaker. Order, please. More the Nova Honourable Sc Premier has the floor. And we're going to continue to move this province forward. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. 
thank you. Mr. Speaker, last week a, a group of 40 organizations and businesses, including the Anglican Diocese of Nova Scotia and PEI, wrote the Premier urging the continuation of the fracking ban in Nova Scotia. The context for this is the deep uncertainty the government has created by its failure to proclaim the legislated fracking ban. Mr. Speaker, Ron Cutler, the Anglican Archbishop, knows that a commitment is not a 99% deal. A commitment is a 100% deal, and a 100% deal on a fracking moratorium would be a fracking moratorium that is proclaimed. Will the Premier show himself to be a person of 100% commitments and proclaim the fracking ban? The Honourable Premier. Uh, Mr. Speaker, as I said before, Mr. Speaker, there is a ban on fracking in Nova Scotia. The Honourable Leader of the Official New Democratic Party. Mr. Speaker, this commitment has the character of a non-commitment commitment, and this non-commitment commitment is precisely what has led the Anglican Church to join 39 other organizations, including the Tatamagush Centre, the Nova Scotia Health Coalition, the Environmental Health Association, and the Canadian Ecumenical Justice Initiative, Kairos, in expressing this concern. And the root of the concern is very simple. People do not have trust in a commitment from a government that fails to enact that commitment. Mr. Speaker, if, a gov if the government's word about the fracking ban is a word that people can trust, why doesn't the Premier demonstrate this by proclaiming the moratorium legislation? The Honourable Premier. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I want to thank uh, the Honourable Member for the question. Mr. Speaker, in 2013, we laid out a very strong plan for the province, Mr. Speaker. We kept every one of those commitments to continue to move the province forward. We're now, Mr. Speaker, in 2017, we've seen it, Mr. Speaker, we laid out a plan of commitments to this province, and we're continuing to move down that road to ensure the young people see a future for themselves in this, in this province. Pre-primary opportunities, regardless of the socioeconomic circumstance you're born into, every four-year-old is going to get a play-based beginning in their play-based educational start in this province, Mr. Speaker. We see now new hope. Our exports are on the rise, and we're going to continue to go, Mr. Speaker. Every commitment we've made to the people of Nova Scotia, we've kept. The Honourable Leader of the New Democratic Party. Thank you. Nothing in the Premier's response, Mr. Speaker, uh, addresses the concern about the non-commitment commitment that has been put forward in this letter. It's totally reasonable that the Anglican Church and the other signatories, out of a, a deep uh, worry about the dependability of the government's position, that they have joined together to call for an end to all further investigation of the potential development of shale, gas and coal bed, bed methane in the province. I'll table their letter. Mr. Speaker, we, we had a ban on tyre burning for fuel in Nova Scotia and now Lafarge under this government has an approval for burning tires. So I, I want to ask the Premier, will he look the people of Nova Scotia in the eye and give his word that his government will proclaim the fracking ban? The Honourable Premier. Uh, Mr. Speaker, again I want to thank the Honourable Member for the question. I want to thank all those hard-working Nova Scotians who worked with our government, continue to keep our commitments, Mr. Speaker, as we continue to grow this province and move the province forward. We had quite a hole to dig out of, Mr. Speaker, but we finally seen the light, Mr. Speaker, on in this province forward. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Internal Services. On Tuesday in question period, the Minister of Internal Services said to my colleague from Argyle Barrington, and I quote, I'd like to assure the member that safeguarding the public's privacy is of utmost importance. She said that here, on this floor, in this house, knowing that 7,000 non-public documents were in the wind. She said the public's pri privacy is of utmost importance, while 250 documents she knew contained highly sensitive information were not secure. She said this knowing that it wasn't an elaborate hack that exposed this information, but simply her department's failure to properly secure it. Can the minister please reconcile her words with her actions? The Honourable Minister of Internal Services. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, we followed the protocol. Police made an arrest, and we believe our actions were appropriate. <laughs> right, right now, our focus is on contacting those individuals who have been directly impacted by this incident. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. Well, Mr. Speaker, the protocol says that public notification can be delayed if the government is counseled to do so only by law enforcement. The minister claims that Halifax Regional Police asked her to delay. 
but the police and her own deputy minister say that the conversation didn't happen. We all saw that. It's on TV. In one scrum, she clearly says she was asked. In another, she says she wasn't. The minister failed to protect personal information. This crime was not sophisticated. The police solved it over the weekend. But this minister doesn't tell anyone until she can point to a kid and say, it's his fault, not ours. Will the minister admit that the charges laid in this case are less about punishing an offender and more about protecting her government? The Honourable Minister of Internal Services. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, we identified a breach. Police were able to make an arrest within less than a week. That is proof that our protocols work. Right now, Mr. Speaker, right now, Mr. Speaker, our focus is on contacting those individuals who have been impacted by this incident. The Honourable Leader of the New Democratic Party. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to direct my question to the Premier, Mr. Speaker. Yesterday, the R.K. McDonald Nursing Home in Antigonish announced that it's reducing staffing hours in all support service departments because of a funding shortfall of a half a million dollars. The result will be that instead of a ratio of one CCA to five or six residents, the ratio now is going to be one for six or seven. Mr. Speaker, I want to ask the Premier, on behalf of the 136 residents of the RK, does he understand that the current provincial funding level for nursing homes is not enough to provide the care that's needed? The Honourable Premier. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. I want to thank the Honourable Member for the question. As he knows, Mr. Speaker, in the budget that was passed uh, last September, October, there was a reinvestment back into long-term care. Uh, as he would know, uh, I'm, the specific question that he raised about this particular nursing home, Mr. Speaker, I, I don't know the details of it, uh, but I promise the Honourable Member I will uh, look into it. The Honourable Leader of the New Democratic Party. Thank you. Uh, in the statement that the RK issued yesterday, the very point the Premier made is addressed. Uh, they said that although they received added targeted funding for food and recreation in the 27-18 budget, uh, this does not for them alleviate the operational and salary pressures that come from the cuts that the government had made over the two straight years before that. In order for them to deal with those pressures, the Home says that now they have to announce they've got no choice but to reduce staffing hours and to combine a number of staff positions. Mr. Speaker, will the Premier acknowledge that it's the cutback decisions of this government that are squarely responsible for the reduction in care hours at the R.K. McDonald Home? The Honourable Premier. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Again, Mr. Speaker, as I said in my first response, uh, I didn't see the details of uh, the announcement yesterday. I certainly will. Uh, follow up uh, from the question from the honourable member. Uh, it's my understanding, though, Mr. Speaker, uh, through the department, uh, that, that the uh, changes are not related to nursing staff or directly patient uh, contact, uh, Mr. Speaker. But I will, as I said early on, do a follow up and get back to the honourable member. Just before we move on to the next question, I want to remind the honourable member uh, that it's uh, not proper to ask questions, quote unquote, on behalf of. Uh, individuals or constituents or groups, so just, just a wording thing. The Honourable House Leader for the Official Opposition. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Uh, you know, this government continues to frame the Foypop incident as some kind of caper, where they outsmarted an Edward Snowden-type intent on taking the province hostage. And what Nova Scotians are actually worried about, Mr. Speaker, is they're worried about the weak security framework around critical government programs. If the minister wants to be as forthcoming as she claims to be, she should not be calling it a breach. This is a leak. And this leak was out in the open for anyone to find for over a year. My question to the Minister of Internal Services, why does the minister continue to evade questions about the weak institutional procedures that led to this leak of thousands of documents? The Honourable Minister of Internal Services. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, the FOIPOP portal is a unique system that's separate from any others. We are working closely with the vendor and to, to have a comprehensive review of the vulnerability and to assess the proper steps that we need to take to mitigate any further safeguards. The Honourable House Leader for the Official Opposition. Yesterday, Mr. Speaker, the Minister spoke at length of how she would 
be constantly rethink, be rethinking security measures and internal services. She spoke of more investments in cybersecurity. That's not the problem here, Mr. Speaker, and the minister still doesn't get that. This was a clear failure in quality assurance and testing. That's basic, basic stuff. The only people disputing the simple facts are across from us here in the House. Yeah. The department didn't do its job for a number of years and was underlined by the Attorney Gen uh, the AG, the, uh, okay. the, the Auditor General uh, last year. And now the minister is saying that we should be thankful for this gross negligence. Mr. Speaker, will the minister finally take responsibility for the unacceptable <coughs> procedures in her department that led to this crisis? The Honourable Minister of Internal Services. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. <laughs> People need to be assured that our systems are safe. So in this particular case, we followed protocols, an arrest was made, and we feel that it came to a successful outcome. But Mr. Speaker, I would like to reiterate that right now, our focus is on contacting those individuals who have been directly impacted by this incident. The Honourable House Leader for the Official Opposition. Uh, Mr. Speaker, we're, we're asking basic, important questions about, of this government about basic security protocols. These same questions are being asked by the media, they're being asked by concerned Nova Scotians, and the talking points from the government say nothing about the basic way these documents were obtained. They say nothing about the fluke discovery of the vulnerability, not by a QA tester, Mr. Speaker, but by a researcher doing non-technical work. They say nothing of why all these documents were sitting in plain sight for years with, uh, in the first place. And that's not good enough for anyone who has shared personally identifiable information with government. Would the minister admit that someone in internal services will need to be held publicly accountable before this severe breach in trust? The Honourable Minister of Internal Services. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, we followed protocols. We were able to identify, police were able to make an arrest. And we believe that our actions were appropriate. Right now, Mr. Speaker, our focus is on contacting those individuals who are directly impacted by this incident. The Honourable House Leader for the Official Opposition. Read the, read the talking points, repeat. Read the talking points, repeat. The Premier and the Minister continue to characterize the breach as a malicious actor picking a lock. And they say the burglar was tracked down, thanks in part to the Minister's quick actions. But there was no lock to pick, Mr. Speaker. Any Nova Scotian with internet access, which is not everybody, and a rudimentary understanding of how web pages are indexed could have been done, could have done the exact same thing. Some may have done it without even knowing, Mr. Speaker, and wouldn't have registered as a significant on access to logs. If it took virtually nothing for the Freedom of Information site to be compromised, what does it say about this government's preparedness for a sophisticated effort to misuse digital assets? The Honourable Minister of Internal Services. Mr. Speaker, people need to be assured that our system, systems are safe, which is why we follow strict protocols and why we look constantly to investigate and to, to safeguard. Right now, our focus is on contacting those individuals who have been impacted by this breach. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. Perhaps the focus should be on ensuring a safe site. <laughs> Citizens accept that they must share some of their most intimate information with their government. But the unspoken contract between citizens and their government is that the government will guard that information and protect the privacy of its citizens. When that contract is broken, Mr. Speaker, and when private information is made public, citizens feel betrayed and their trust in their government is broken. And again, it wasn't an elaborate hack that exposed this information by simply a department's failure to properly secure it. Does the minister agree that when governments make private information public and when the public trust is broken, ministers must be accountable. The Honourable Minister of Internal Services. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, we are following protocols that are designed to keep our system straight, to secure and safe. Right now, our focus is on contacting those individuals who have been impacted by this incident. Good job. The Honourable uh, Leader of the Official Opposition. Mr. Speaker, the concept of ministerial responsibility is one that most democracies take very seriously. 
That's why in 2011, when he revealed private information about a Fredericton area woman, New Brunswick Minister of Justice Bernard LeBlanc resigned and did the right thing. That's why in January, after a security breach that may have led to the large-scale disclosure of citizens' sensitive personal information, two senior Swedish ministers resigned, Mr. Speaker. The minister chose to protect her government rather than Nova Scotians. The police confirmed that. Will she resign today? The Honourable Minister of Internal Services. Order, please. Order, please. The Honourable Minister of Internal Services. Mr. Spe Mr. Speaker, I serve at the pleasure of the Premier. Right now, my focus is on contacting those individuals who have been impacted by this breach. Good job. The Honourable Member for Dartmouth South. The Honourable Member for Dartmouth South. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Justice. In preparation for the legalization of cannabis, the government has introduced amendments to the Smoke Free Places Act. One amendment is to change the definition of smoke to include the use of a vaporizer, defined as a device that burns or heats any substance intended to be smoked or inhaled. Users of medical cannabis, Mr. Speaker, which will continue to be federally regulated, are concerned that they will not have a safe space to consume cannabis for symptom relief. Mr. Speaker, has the minister considered providing an exemption for individuals using vaporized medical cannabis with a federally approved medical device? The Honourable Minister of Justice. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, during the, the work undertaken in this particular matter uh, and the consultation that took place uh, around uh, safe spaces and secondhand smoke. Uh, we actually expanded, Mr. Speaker, the Smoke Free Places Act uh, to put restrictions in place, Mr. Speaker, to enhance public safety. But to the point of my colleague's question, there remains what we believe to be reasonable spaces for those who choose to consume recreational cannabis as well as those, Mr. Speaker, who have uh, the legal authority to consume medicinal marijuana. The Honourable Member for Dartmouth South. Mr. Speaker, uh, those aren't the concerns we've been hearing. The changes that have been proposed by the government allow landlords to distinguish between smoking tobacco and smoking cannabis. However, the use of medical cannabis within the definition of smoke has raised the concern that landlords will be able to restrict the ability of individuals to use medical cannabis in rented properties. Mr. Speaker, individuals with disabilities are often already limited in their available housing options. We don't want to create additional unnecessary barriers. What reassurance can the minister provide that medical use Users of cannabis will not lose their rights when recreational cannabis becomes legal. The Honourable Minister of Justice. <clears throat> thank, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank my colleague for the question because it is important to differentiate between uh, the, the, the medicinal stream regulated by Health Canada and, and the recreational consumption captured in the bill we've introduced. Uh, Mr. Speaker, the Smoke Free Places Act provides for that latitude. The expansion of the Smoke Free Places Act that we have addressed, Mr. Speaker, is intended to enhance public safety, particularly around our youth. And I'm confident, Mr. Speaker, that, that there are those opportunities for those who have legal permission to consume medicinal marijuana remains in place in our communities. The Honourable Member for Cape Breton Richmond. Mr. Speaker, the growing number of people without access to guaranteed palliative care services is not something that is unique to one area of the province. This, Mr. Speaker, is the reality at the Strait Richmond Hospital in Cape Breton, Richmond. Earlier this week, I shared in this house Danny and Linda Latimer's heartbreaking circumstances. I am saddened to announce that Danny's battle with cancer has ended, Mr. Speaker. Danny Latimer died yesterday morning. 
In the last week of his life, Linda Latimer found the courage to speak up about the injustice and the indignity of their experience in the final days of Danny's life. I would encourage others to follow her example. In the last year, at least seven palliative patients and their families were forced the indignancy of spending their last days with their loved ones in the busy ER at the Strait <coughs> Richmond Hospital. Seven. I would like to ask the minister if he believes it is acceptable to have palliative care patients spending the last days of their life in the busy ER at the Strait Richmond Hospital. The Honourable Minister of Health. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. I thank the member for bringing uh, this topic uh, forward today. Uh, of course, Mr. Speaker, uh, circumstances like those that were brought forward uh, last week uh, are, are a concern for all Nova Scotians. Uh, but we want to assure the member opposite and all Nova Scotians uh, as they, they move, especially if they have a loved one uh, towards the end of life uh, requiring uh, palliative care services, uh, that uh, we continue to expand these services, Mr. Speaker. The NSHA is uh, working to ensure that there's standardization in terms of the approach to providing palliative care services in our hospitals across the province, but also recognizing that there are other locations where people choose to uh, make these services available, including in their own homes, Mr. Speaker. And that's why we have programs that have uh, physicians and nurses and even paramedics, Mr. Speaker, to support the families in their own home going through these services. There, the Honourable Member for Cape Breton, Richmond. Mr. Speaker, in the fall session, I asked a question to the Minister regarding two years' worth of unanswered correspondence from the Strait Richmond Palliative Care Society. Two years. Letters to the NSHA, the Deputy Minister, the Minister, and even the Premier. I will table those letters, Mr. Speaker. In this correspondence is also included the Strait Area and Richmond Palliative Care Program proposal dated October 2015. I will table that document as well, Mr. Speaker. It is a collaborative approach from the Strait Richmond Area Community Health Board and the Strait Richmond Palliative Care. The Premier has agreed earlier this week that the circumstances of palliative care patients dying in ERs and hallways and storage closets is unacceptable. Mr. Speaker, could the Minister then explain why two years' worth of correspondence and a plan of action for palliative care services submitted in October 2015 have had no action and have gone unanswered? The Honourable Minister of Health. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I'm pleased uh, to advise the member opposite that, in fact, uh, there was a lot of action taking place uh, under the leadership of the former Minister of Health and Wellness, the current Minister of Community, Culture and Heritage. Mr. Speaker, during that uh, time period, uh, the, the Minister of the Department of Health and Wellness uh, brought forward a, a proposal uh, to establish a framework for hospice uh, care uh, in the uh, province of Nova Scotia, Mr. Speaker. That has come forward. So now there's a framework in place so that when communities come forward, Mr. Speaker, looking for this type of service, we have a framework that the staff can work with them to establish these programs in their communities. The Honourable Member for Kings North. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Health. Asking questions about the Valley Hospice has been a constant in my political career. I think I've asked the question every session since 2013. And with the great fanfare of last summer's hospice announcement built in Kentville, I thought that I was done asking those questions, but sadly not. Valley residents are concerned that the hospice has not yet put a spade in the ground, although they were promised that it would, the build would begin this spring. Can the minister tell me if a spade will get in the ground this spring as promised on the hospice build? The Honourable Minister of Health. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the member uh, for again bringing uh, the attention uh, about this uh, hospice uh, program. That's a, a, a part of the work that I'd uh, mentioned in the previous uh, question, in response to the previous question, that indeed there's work uh, ongoing throughout the province uh, in regard to providing uh, hospice uh, services, uh, and that work uh, was ongoing during the time period the previous member uh, was referring to. Uh, again, the work in uh, Valley Hospice in Kentville, Mr. Speaker, is ongoing. A lot of work has been done to date, and uh, that project's going to be uh, operating as, as quickly as possible. The member would refer to the budget. Uh, we have the capital money in there, Mr. Speaker, to uh, have the work uh, begin uh, this year. The Honourable Member for Kings North. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, for that answer from the Minister. Mr. Speaker, the Valley Hospice hasn't yet gone out to tender, yet the Halifax Hospice was announced to be up and running in 2018. Kings County has had their money raised for over four, five years, yet Halifax has not done their fundraising yet. The people of Kings County have been doing their work and they're waiting for government to meet them. My question for the Minister is this, why has the government so, been so willing to move forward on the Halifax Hospice, yet move so slowly on the Valley Hospice project? The Honourable Minister of Health. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. I think uh, as the member has 
indicated, he's quite aware and, and quite engaged on uh, the topic of the Valley uh, Hospice. Uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, recognizing that, I'm sure the members are uh, aware that this particular project uh, has gone through a few different design iterations. Uh, certainly, you want to make sure in the planning process you get the right design uh, in place to ensure that the proper services are being provided uh, with also the best uh, value for that uh, design uh, that's being provided. So uh, while there were some delays at the front end of this uh, work, Mr. Speaker, I believe that's going to be in the best interest of all those people in the community who are going to be making use of this facility on a go-forward basis. And I'd like to recognize and thank the many people in the community who have uh, contributed uh, to this uh, initiative, both campaigning for it and contributing financially. The Honourable Member for Sackville Beaverbank. Yeah, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question uh, is to the Minister of Municipal Affairs. This week, CBC reported that Business Cape Breton had recently uh, been dissolved. Four employees have been issued layoff slips and landlords been given notice. The switch to a REN for Economic Development Agency was driven by the province and not the CBRM municipality. My question for the government is, what is why is the government trying to fix what isn't broken and what is Wren going to do for Kay Breton that business Kay Breton wasn't doing? The Honourable Minister of Municipal Affairs. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank the member for the question. Essentially, the REN program is the program that municipalities utilize to, uh, to uh, receive funds from the Department of Municipal Affairs. It's a very transparent way for us to distribute money to municipalities. They work with the private sector. They work with community organizations to stimulate economic development. Uh, I've indicated to the CBRM almost a year ago that this was the path forward for them, that we would sit down with them and look at the economic tools that they have at their disposal. The REN is that model to do that. That is the most transparent way for us to report to Nova Scotians how money is being spent on economic development and we're more than willing to sit down with the CBRM uh, to, have, to work through that process to get it done. The Honourable Member for Sackville Beaverbank. Uh, yeah, thank you, Mr. Uh, Minister. My question uh, continues, though, so, is that uh, Business K. Breton rece recently received uh, $400,000 in funding last year in the fiscal year. Uh, on the website, the agency has claimed that it helped over 134 clients in new business development between April 2013 and April 2017, with a projected uh, job potential of over 290 two people, I'd uh, table that. Um, it seems ending a long-standing economic development organization in favor of a newer model uh, with, with an unproven history so far in this province does not necessarily look like progress. So my question to the Minister is when will CBRM have a new REN up and running to replace Business K Breton and what are the targets that are being set for that REN? The Honourable Minister of Municipal Affairs. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and, and I'll say this too. I've had the opportunity to work with many of the economic development agencies, including Business Cape Breton. Uh, in my time as a councillor in an MLA, they're a great organization, but we deal directly with municipalities. The REN is uh, the most transparent way for us to distribute funds to municipal units to support economic development in their communities. I indicated this to the mayor of the CBRM almost a year ago, that this was the process to move forward to make sure the money that we expend is transparent and accountable to Nova Scotia. We are going through that process. Staff has met with the CBRM. Uh, we're trying to move as quickly as we can, and uh, we are uh, taking everything into consideration to ensure that the CBRM and other municipal units across the province uh, receive all the benefits of the REN and that we can design them in a way that best suits the needs and the strengths of communities across the province. The Honourable Member for Halifax Needham. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Trade. The Digby Ferry has been shut down for three months now. Trucker Brian Reynolds said it is the longest closure he can remember, and I'll table that. And it means trucks are spending an extra 14 hours on the road going around through Truro and the top Cobequid Pass and then coming back. That's impacting drivers and it's hurting seafood exports. So I think people in those industries would like to know, given the importance of our, our fishery exports, how is this government working with Transport Canada and Bay Ferries to make sure the delay Please don't continue. The Honourable Minister of Business. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the member for the question. Uh, obviously, the, we've had a tremendous growth in trade here in the province uh, with some of the, the, the looming trade agreements that we have. <laughs> 
nationally, internationally, Mr. Speaker, uh, th we know that trend will continue, led by fisheries, uh, the, the Minister of Fisheries, and, and the great people that are in, in all of our communities uh, driving uh, fisheries growth and, and export. Uh, with respect to the, the, the individuals, uh, the, the member's question, um, we'd be happy to talk to Transport Canada, Mr. Reynolds, and Bay Ferries about uh, these, uh, these issues uh, that the member certainly uh, believes to be pressing. Uh, I haven't heard any specific details on that, so if the member wants to line up a conversation, I'd be happy to participate. Thanks. The Honourable Member for Halifax Needham. Mr. Speaker, this project, this interruption to a crucial ferry link, was supposed to be finished by early March. Then it was late March. Now it's looking like it's going to be late April. The repairs are delayed in part because Transport Canada didn't gather all the materials before it started. The work could have happened in October when there was less demand for the ferry for transporting seafood products. And it, it all makes me wonder if perhaps the Premier should have taken one less trip to China and maybe one more to Digby. So my question... <laughs> So my question for the minister is, given that we knew repairs would be necessary, what did the province do to make sure that the impacts on fishery exports would be minimized? The Honourable Premier. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Mr. Speaker, unlike the Honourable Member and her party, Mr. Speaker, we believe we have world-class seafood and, and agri-products in this province. Mr. Speaker, we've continued to look for new markets to ensure that we get the right price, Mr. Speaker. We've seen lobster stay, Mr. Speaker, at historic highs in rural communities. That money is spinning around on deck hands, Mr. Speaker, car dealerships. But if the honor and I want to go and if the honourable member would do her research, Mr. Speaker, the issue is actually in New Brunswick, Mr. Speaker. The national government in the province of New Brunswick are working on the terminal in New Brunswick, Mr. Speaker. The infrastructure in Nova Scotia is safe and ready to use. The honourable member for Inverness. I recently asked a question uh, of the Minister responsible for Human Rights about organizations who could not sign the Trudeau government's attestation policy for student jobs because they believe an unborn person is a child. When I raised the issue in the House, the Minister agreed with the federal government. He stated that the individuals who are being paid under taxpayer dollars must not do any work that goes against the Charter of Rights and Freedoms. Mr. Speaker, the Charter doesn't say anything about reproductive rights. And in fact, the Chesterco Museum and Historical Society in Port Hood stated that it does, however, include the protection of the fundamental freedoms of thought, belief, opinion, and expression. They went on to say, denying our application on that basis, on the basis we hold a view that differs from that of the current federal government, is a violation of our charter rights. So, Mr. Speaker, it appears that the Chesterco Museum Society knows the the Charter of Rights better than the Minister. Can the Minister explain which part of the Charter of Rights the Chestico Museum is going against? The Honourable Minister of Justice. Thank you, uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, the question that my colleague has posed, I believe directed to the Minister of Labour and Advanced Education, uh, is a federal matter. Uh, Mr. Speaker, for the information of the House, uh, the Minister of Justice has responsibility for the human rights portfolio, uh, and I can't speak, Mr. Speaker, to the policies and strategies of the federal government. The Honourable <laughs> Member for Inverness. Well, Mr. Speaker, I'll direct this question to the Premier. If there is anyone in this chamber we must count on to see the truth, it is the Premier. These organizations are not breaking any laws, yet they are being denied government benefits because of what they believe. 200 years ago, in chambers like this, there were penal laws that we got rid of because they were seen as archaic, and that was 200 years ago. How is this required attestation any different than a penal law? Will the Premier find a few thousand dollars to fund student employment for the organizations who've had the courage to stand up for what they believe? The Honourable Premier. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. I I was going to tell the honourable member to encourage every organization to apply to the student programs here in the province. We'll be happy to work with them to ensure. We'll be happy to work with them to ensure, Mr. Speaker, that uh, the, the optimistic young Nova Scotians that are applying for jobs and those that come here to go to work continue to see a bright future for themselves in our province. And we'll use the precious public dollars that we have that we continue to do to provide them co-op placements, summer job placements, or actually work with employers to find them permanent work here in Nova Scotia. <laughs> The Honourable Member for Sydney River, Myra Lewisburg. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question through you is to the Minister of TIR. Mr. Mr. Speaker, uh, recently we, we've heard much about the bridge in 
in my regret, and I, I know the minister is working on a solution there, and part of the solution involves a 20 plus kilometer detour that's taking place. One of the roads, and I thank the minister for that, the, the Horns Road is being redone this year, but the other part is the Brickyard Road, which leads to uh, uh, one of our finest parks in Nova Scotia at the um, Myra River Park. The road is very poor, so my question to the minister is, would he consider adding that road to his list so that when he comes in May, we'll be able to take him on a good road? The Honourable Minister of Transportation. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the member opposite for the question. Uh, we are well down the road in uh, determining what the solution is for the uh, My, Regret, uh, My Regret Bridge. We actually determined that we need uh, a little over six metre clearance there based on the study that uh, has been done. And of course, that elevates the uh, arc of the bridge and does add to the cost. We don't have a full appreciation yet for what that is going to be. Uh, what the member brings forward will be part of the analysis that we do uh, when we get to the point as to whether or not that bridge will be replaced or not. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Sydney River, Myra Lewisburg. Oh, thank you very much for that answer. I'm not sure I'm happy, but I thank you for the answer. <laughs> there is a burning question, Mr. Speaker, that I have to ask the Minister as we seem to be getting into the dying days of this session. And last year, on the on the new Boston Road, Mr. Speaker, we actually got a portion of pavement. And I thank the Minister for that and the former Minister as well. <clears throat> My request, Mr. Speaker, is can we get the same amount again this year? The Honourable Minister of Transportation. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, and at the member's invitation, uh, I look forward to touring the New Boston uh, Road later on this spring, and uh, we'll just see where we're at when we look at the overall picture for that area. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Coal Arbor Eastern Passage. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Education. As I've said in the past, the new Island View High School in Eastern Passage was deliberately built with the knowledge that the students there would not have access to the IB or Skills Trades program. Last week, 16 students from Island View High School signed up to take a grade 10, one class called Skills Trade 10 to give them the prerequisite to apply for Ode of Area Transfer to Coal Harbor High for grade 11 and 12. At the time that they did that, uh, they applied to the Department of Education for that one class, and the Department of Education said no to that one class. Will the Minister of Education reverse this decision and give the students from Shearwater, Cow Bay, and Eastern Passage a fighting chance to secure the future that they deserve? The Honourable Minister of Education. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Of course, we want all of our students to succeed in this province and every one of our schools. That's why we've made the important investments we've made. That's why we've made the difficult decisions to change our administrative structure, our governance structure. So at the end of the day, each of those students in all of our schools are getting exactly what they need from our education system. Thank you very much. The Honourable Member for Coal Harbour Eastern Passage. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. As the Minister knows, I spoke to him about this on Monday, on Tuesday, on Wednesday, and on Thursday. And I'm also aware that when the education bill was brought forward, that the minister stated that the goal was to give more authority and autonomy at the local level, and specifically to the high school principals. The request of 16 students was for one class. The high school isn't even finished being built yet. I would maintain that the time to consider building capacity for the skills trade program would be now before the construction is completed. So I'm wondering if the minister will consider meeting with the principal of the high school to discuss this issue, and if the department has any intention of allowing the grade 10 skills trade program to ever be offered at the school, would he not concede that now would be the time to do so? The Honourable Minister of Education. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I'll take the member's comments under advisement. The Honourable Member for Dartmouth North. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Community Services. 
The Canada Child Benefit is an important program for reducing child and family poverty. When children are removed from a home by Child Protective Services, the benefit goes with them. And when children are returned to the home, it often takes months before the benefit is restored. When I asked the Minister about this in estimates, she indicated she was not aware of the issue. However, we have heard from many cases, of many cases, where frontline uh, child protection social workers say that this has happened. Mr. Speaker, is the Minister concerned about this breakdown of communication between her office and the front lines? <clears throat> the Honourable Minister of Community Services. I want to thank the Honourable Member for the question. I want to assure her that we want the best outcomes for the children who come into our care, even if it's briefly, Mr. Speaker. And uh, at that time, I committed to her that we would be uh, meeting with our, our social workers as well as uh, our federal partners to make sure that that does not happen. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Dartmouth North. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, uh, please thank the Minister for her encouraging response. But there is a simple fix here that would uh, make a significant difference to families who are in a very vulnerable stage of reunification. The Department already has a system for providing individuals with maintenance enforcement payments up front and then recovering those funds from the payer. You would think that when the, the, the groups involved are two levels of government that we could have already figured this out. Mr. Speaker, will the Minister commit to developing an agreement with the federal government to ensure families involved with child protection services do not go for months without the child uh, Canada Child Benefit amounts they're entitled to. The Honourable Minister of Community Services. As I've already communicated to the Honourable Member, we're happily working on this particular issue and I thank her for bringing it forward. The Honourable Member for Cumberland North. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. This week, the emergency collaborative emergency centres in Spring Hill, Parsbro, and Pugwash, all three of them were closed, Mr. Speaker. This leaves the citizens in these communities without close access to urgent care, some of them having to drive over 80 minutes if in times of emergency to the regional hospital. This regional hospital was not designed to serve 34,000 people. Dr. Brian Ferguson of Amherst said this week, we can't be a regional hospital for 34,000 people with only 11 emergency beds, and I'll table this document. Question to the Minister of Health is, will he look at increasing the number of emergency beds and increase physician staffing resources to handle the increased patient load at the regional hospital. The Honourable Minister of Health. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. I thank the member for the question. Uh, first, I want to assure uh, the member and all Nova Scotians that uh, Nova Scotians do not go without emergency care, Mr. Speaker. We have a, a top-notch uh, emergency system in Nova Scotia, Mr. Speaker, and in a health care emergency, Mr. Speaker, encourage them to call 911. With respect to uh, the services and the availability in our, in our hospitals, Mr. Speaker, I ongoing work with our partners the Nova Scotia Health Authority for emergency rooms and all aspects of our health care system. We're always looking for opportunities to improve those services and we'll continue that work. The Honourable Member for Cumberland North. Mr. Speaker, I will respectfully uh, disagree with this response that we have a top-notch emergency services in this province. You ask the people of Nova Scotia. We do not. There are deficiencies all across this province. We have a problem, Mr. Speaker, in this province with physicians leaving. This month, we learned again, we have an internal medicine physician leaving in Amherst, family doc leaving in Spring Hill. When I asked them why, you know what they said? They said, we're leaving to BC to make less money because we're not respected in this province. They said there is an anti-physician culture. I had someone tell me in the Nova Scotia Health Authority that physicians are the problem. When will the Minister of Health take charge of the Nova Scotia Health Authority Board and CEO and take responsibility for this ineffective leadership of the Nova Scotia Health Authority? The Honourable Minister of Health. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, and I, I thank the member for highlighting the fact that Nova Scotia indeed doesn't have the lowest paid physicians in the country. Uh, based upon the information she just brought to the floor, Mr. Speaker, we continue to work with Doctors Nova Scotia and our, our other partners in the health care system uh, to uh, provide the services, to increase uh, access to primary care. We know that there needs to be more work to be done, Mr. Speaker, and that's why we announced almost uh, $40 million going towards physician, uh, physician compensation, Mr. Speaker, to encourage them to provide uh, primary care, to be there for Nova Scotia. Oceans. We know there's more work to be done, and that's why we're continuing to work with our partners, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Northside Westmount. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, we hear news of more and more closures of emergency rooms in Cape Breton. More and more services lost 
more and more doctors leaving. But we hear in this chamber, Mr. Speaker, that over 100 doctors have come, but not once have we heard how many doctors have left. Mr. Speaker, people are getting very frustrated with the health care system in Cape Breton and the lack of input from this government. Mr. Speaker, the lack of answers from this health minister are making people more and more frustrated, to the point where they're going to march in the streets on April the 28th in North Sydney. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, I ask the minister, please answer my question. I don't want an expensive preamble. How much you're great, how great everything is, how much you're doing. Please answer the question. Will you attend that rally? Set the people's mind at ease in North City that health care will be coming back to North City to Cape Breton. The Honourable yes, Minister of Health. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the member. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I thank the member for the question. Uh, Mr. Speaker. Order, please. The Honourable Minister of Health. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, the member had asked about uh, the uh, net uh, flow of physicians, Mr. Speaker, in the province. And, Mr. Speaker, that net flow for the minister. Order, please. It's a simple question. Order. The Honourable Minister of Health. If, uh, Mr. Speaker, if the member uh, would look at the, the Kaihai reports, Mr. Speaker, it shows very clearly what the net uh, results were, Mr. Speaker, uh, for physician flow into order. the province. No. Order, please. The Honourable Member for Northside Westmount will come to order. The Honourable Minister of Health. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, order, please. Time allotted for oral questions put by members to ministers has expired. We'll now move on to government business. The Honourable Government House Leader. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I move that you do now leave the chair and the House resolve itself into a Committee of the Whole on bill. The House will now recess for a few minutes while it resolves itself into the Committee of the Whole House on Bills.
Order. I call the Committee of the Whole House on Bills to come to order. I recognize the Honourable Government House Leader. Thank you, Madam Chair. Would you please call Bill No. 65, the Psychologist Act? I call Bill No. 65, the Clerk. Madam Chair, Bill No. 65 was referred to the House by the Committee on Law Amendments with amendments and contains 10 clauses. Shall Clause 1 carry? Shall Clause 2 carry? I recognize the member for Halifax Needham. Thank, thank, you, uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you for this opportunity um, to speak, uh, to, uh, sorry, to move um, a proposed NDP amendment on, you'll see this, uh, it was circulated LAC NDP 1. These, um, these amendments were originally drafted for uh, Law Amendments Committee, um, but then the, the the matter was put over to a second meeting of law amendments and we didn't have an opportunity to move. So um, I'm moving an amendment uh, to subclause 2.1, delete and substitute the following. Subsection 4.1 of chapter 32 is amended by striking out clause A and substituting the following clauses. A, four members who are registered psychologists elected in accordance with the regulations by those whose names appear on the register of psychologists or the register of candidates. And uh, semicolon AA, one member who is the president of the Association of Psychologists of Nova Scotia or is designated by that person, semicolon and. Um, I was um, impressed by the importance of making these amendments by the presentation of Todd Leader, who is the president of the Association of Psychologists of Nova Scotia. He appeared at law amendments on Monday, um, and he pointed out a flaw in this, uh, in, in the, the act as, as currently proposed, in that there is no provision in the act currently to maintain a connection between the association of psychologists and the uh, Nova Scotia Board of Examiners in Psychology. Um, the Association of Psychologists of Nova Scotia was instrumental in, in getting the original act um, passed, drafted and passed in 2000, and now in the amended legislation, it would not have any standing. Um, and that, that struck some alarm bells for me. Um, I shared with the member from Sackville uh, Cobbequid that one of my earliest uh, journalism assignments when I was still a casual staffer with CBC in, in Nova Scotia was to cover the, um, the great political drama uh, involved in the association of estheticians and um, Oh my goodness, I, I, I can't exactly cite the act, but there's an, an act that governs beauty salons and estheticians. And, uh, pardon? The Cosmetology Act, the Cosmetology Act. And it was literally, it was like I was in a John Grisham um, thriller uh, because the amount of, the, the, the amount of political intrigue, this, this act kept coming back to the house because the people who were actually working in beauty salons, um, hairdressers across Halifax, had their democratic power usurped by... Order. Uh, it's sorry. a bit chatty here in the chamber. I'd like the chatter to come down. And the member for Halifax Needham has the floor. Madam Chair. Um, hairdressers in Halifax ended up uh, sort of losing control um, of the body that regulated them, such that actually many, many hairdressers in the Halifax area in particular ended up operating as barbers because they could not, um, they could not manage to operate their businesses within the regulations that were um, being devised by a body that initially they had supported to get set up to regulate them. Anyhow, I don't know that the situation is exactly analogous, but I, I do feel compelled um, to, to urge members to support this amendment, and, and particularly given that um, at law amendments on Monday when, when Todd Leader um, appeared, he, uh, his, his submission 
uh, was not made available to members. And, and I do have a copy of that submission, which I will table. And, and in fact, the way that, um, and, and this may have been an error on, on his part, um, but the way that uh, he attempted to make that submission was through a letter to the Nova Scotia Board of Examiners in Psychology. And the last line of his letter of February 27, 2018 was, thank you for the opportunity to provide this input and to have this original letter included as part of your submission to government. But at the law amendments table, we received the submission from uh, the Nova Scotia Board of Examiners of Psychology without that original letter attached. And so the members of the committee did not have the benefit of that advice. And particularly in, uh, you know, in general, um, he writes that the APNS accepts the proposal to have the, the Nova Scotia Board of Examiners take over its own election process in accordance with established fair and transparent procedures. Um, it has some concerns about some other um, elements of this amended legislation. Um, and, and, and he says, we would therefore only be supportive of this amendment if APNS is to be a full collaborating partner in the process of creating the appropriate and fair wording at all stages of this regulatory change. And then he speaks to the amendments that we have put forward. Um, requesting that in the interest of ongoing going communication and collaboration between these complementary organizations, an ex officio position be established on the Nova Scotia Board of Examiners in Psychology for the president of APNS or his her designate to guarantee good information exchange on an ongoing basis and provide the infrastructure for continued collaborative work. Um, Madam Chair, democracy happens at many different levels in our society and including within organizations and regulatory bodies that um, are, are set up by professional uh, organizations and I think it is important that we consider these amendments to ensure that a uh, good democratic process happen within um, within the governance of the uh, of psychologists so thank you very much madam speaker can you table that document yeah. table both of those letters thank you shall the amendment carry no the amendment does not carry. Shall clauses three? No. Shall clause two carry? carry. Shall, shall clause three to ten? The remaining clause carry. carry. Shall the title carry? carry? Shall the bill carry? carry? The bill is carried.
I recognize the Honourable Government House Leader. Thank you, Madam Chair. Would you please call Bill Number 99, House of Assembly Act? I call Bill 99, the Clerk. Madam Chair, Bill 99 was referred to the House by the Committee on Law Amendments without amendments and contains four clauses. <coughs> Shall the first clause carry? Carry. Shall clause two carry? Carry. I recognize the Honourable Op Mem <laughs> Government House Leader for the Official Opposition. Thank you. I'm reading this one as page two, clause one, proposed clause 5B. Okay. Was oh, so a clause one? Okay. Is it us? Your five B, your five C. That's what's confusing. Okay. That's Excuse me. We'll go back to clause one. Sorry. And uh, I draw everyone's attention to be sure that you have all the change sheets. For, you should have two, one with CWHBPC1, and you should also have CWHBNDP1. Um, the, the members of the government do not have... Maybe we got the wrong one. We got NDP1. There's two. There's two. There's CWHBPC1. There is CWHBNDP1. Okay. We will be referring to CWHBPC1. I would like confirmation that all members have received the two change sheets. Okay, we will proceed. I recognize the member for Argyle Barrington. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair, for clarifying this. Um, again, this is uh, page two, clause one, proposed clause 5B, 5B, F, or 5, 5B, F, delete and reletter G and H and F and G under, C, under uh, CHW. Uh, CWHB PC-1, and again, this is to remove the thought of non-contiguous constituencies. Uh, we heard it loud and clear at law amendments uh, the other day uh, that the Acadian Federation, its members, Acadian groups across the province uh, were very concerned about the issue of non-contiguous riding. So those are those ridings that may be larger but not connected to one another. So if you can, uh, if you can see, uh, maybe in Argyle with a Clare and a Shittycon or Richmond, being one constituency, which wouldn't make sense of trying to uh, service or effectively represent uh, that kind of uh, constituency. Now, I know uh, this was a recommendation in the uh, Commission on Effective Representation. I understand that uh, totally, uh, but it, it doesn't function. It's not used anywhere else in the country. Uh, there was very few examples around the world uh, of that kind of representation working. So we heard loud, loud and clear from the community that they didn't want to see this provision there. Uh, maybe it's something they can look at for the future, uh, but in this case, uh, they felt it should be taken out of this bill, and I so move uh, to, uh, to uh, remove it from uh, this bill. Shall the amendment carry? No. The amendment is defeated. I recognize the member for Halifax, Shabukto. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, speaking to uh, CWHB NDP 1, uh, which refers to page 2, clause 1, 
the proposed clause 5 5CC uh, to be deleted and then uh, the relettering uh, D to F as C to E. Uh, Madam Chair, the purpose of this amendment is to delete the clause of Bill 99 which provides the select committee with the authority to determine in advance of the work of the Electoral Boundaries Commission the minimum or the maximum number of electoral districts that the Electoral Boundaries Commission is empowered to consider. The Commission on Effective Representation of Acadians and African Nova Scotians uh, speaks many, many times about how the question of effective representation of minority populations in Nova Scotia is a question that calls for creative and innovative thinking. And amongst the creative and innovative solutions, the Electoral Boundaries Commission may well uh, wish to consider, perhaps in ways that haven't yet been thought of, is the number of electoral districts in the province. Therefore, it's our submission that the Select Committee should not have the capacity to limit in advance the Electoral Boundary Commission's ability to do so. So I move this amendment. Okay. Shall the amendment carry? No. The amendment is defeated. Shall the remaining clauses carry? Yes. Shall, shall clause one carry? Yes. Shall the remaining clauses carry? Yes. Shall the title carry? Yes. No. You can speak. You want to speak on the title? Shall the bill carry? Yeah. The bill is carried. I recognize the Honourable Government House Leader. Thank you, Madam Chair. Would you please call Bill Number 107, Labour Standards Code. I call Bill 107. The Clerk. Madam Chair, Bill 107 was referred to the House from the Committee on Law Amendments with amendments and contains nine clauses. Shall Clause 1 carry? Carry. Shall Clause 2 to 5 carry? Carry. Shall Clause 6 carry? <coughs> 
I recognize the Honourable Member for Cape Breton Centre. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I refer the House to CWHB NDP-1. We are proposing the following, page 4, clause 6, proposed section 60Z, add the following <laughs> subsection immediately after subsection 1. Number 2, notwithstanding subsection 1, and clause 60ZA 1A. A, the first five days of a leave of absence taken under this section must be paid work days, and B, the employer shall continue to maintain a benefit plan in which the employee participated prior to the commencement of a leave of absence under this section and the employee shall continue to pay the same share of the cost of the benefit plan as the employee did paid prior to the commencement of the leave. Madam Chair, I would just like to reiterate again my comments that um, while we do appreciate the government moving this um, legislation through to allow victims of domestic violence to have paid or to have time off, we do want to reiterate the importance of that time being paid, and I so do move. Okay. Shall the amendment carry? No. Oh, sorry. Uh, sorry. Um, I recognize the member for Argyle Barrington. No. Oh, North, North Side West Mount. Use sorry. the same tailor. We don't look alike. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Madam Chair. And Madam Chair, the uh, the intent of this bill, Madam Chair, is, is good. Uh, the idea that someone who is uh, involved in a domestic violence to get some time off, to get their affairs in order, to get out of the situation, to deal with legal or medical appointments, to deal with this is a great idea. What we heard though, Madam Chair, was that the fact of the matter is a lot of the people who are in a domestic violence situation are in low paying jobs or jobs that they can't really afford to take that time off without some kind of financial reimbursement. Uh, the first five days, Madam Chair, uh, we heard the government in law amendments think that they're going to consider it. Uh, the fact that five days may not be the number, maybe it's two days to start, maybe it's some other time to start, but the fact that it's been here and we can look at somehow making the, and allowing the government or allowing the business people to apply to the government for reimbursement of those fees. From what we've heard, it's about a million dollars if everybody who applied or had domestic assault against them last year applied for this would cost about a million dollars. In a nine billion dollar budget, that doesn't seem like a lot of money. So we're truly worried about the workers and domestic violence in this province. This is not a bad amendment to, to accept, Madam Chair. Thank you. Okay. So anyone else? Anyone else? Okay. Shall the amendment carry? No. The amendment is defeated. Shall clause six carry? Yes. Shall the remaining clauses carry? Yes. Shall the title carry? Yes. Shall the bill carry? Yes. The bill is carried. I recognize the Honourable Government House Leader. Thank you, Madam Chair. Would you please call Bill Number 114, Gaelic College Foundation Act? I call Bill 114, the Clerk. Madam Chair, Bill Number 114 was referred to the House by the Committee on Law Amendments without amendments and contains 21 clauses. Shall Clause 1 carry? carry. Shall the remaining clauses carry? carry. Shall the title carry? carry. Shall the bill carry? The bill is carried. Ready? 
Ready, Chair? I call on the Honourable Government House Leader. Thank you, Madam Chair. Would you please call Bill Number 116, the Financial Measures Act? I call Bill 116. The Clerk. Madam Chair, Bill Number 116 was referred to the House by the Committee on Law Amendments without amendments and contains 68 clauses. Shall Clause 1 carry? Carry. Shall the remaining clauses carry? Carry. Shall the title carry? Carry. Shall the bill carry? Carry. The bill is carried. I recognize the Honourable Government House Leader. Thank you, Madam Chair. Would you please call Bill Number 118, the Municipal Government Act and the Halifax Regional Municipality Charter, respecting parental accommodation. I call Bill 118. The Clerk. Madam Chair, Bill 118 was referred to the House by the Committee on Law Amendments without amendments and contains 12 clauses. Shall Clause 1 carry? Yes. Shall the remaining clauses carry? Yes. Shall the title carry? Yes. Shall the bill carry? Yes. The bill is carried. I recognize the Honourable Government House Leader. Thank you, Madam Chair. I move that you do now rise and report these bills. The motion is carried. The committee will now rise and report its business to the House.
Order, please. The Chair of the Committee of the Whole House on Bills will now report. That the Committee of the Whole House on Bills has met and considered the following bills. Bill number 99, Bill number 114, Bill number 116, Bill number 118 without amendments, and Bill number 65 and Bill 107, which were reported with certain amendments by the Law Amendments Committee to the Committee of the Whole House without further amendments, and the Chairman has been instructed to recommend these bills to the favourable consideration of the House. Ordered that these bills be read a third time on a future day. The Honourable Government House Leader. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Would you please call public bills for third reading? We'll now call public bills for third reading. Bill number 79, the Property Valuation Services Corporation Act. We we'll now call Bill number 79, the Property Valuation Services Corporation Act. The Honourable Minister of Municipal Affairs. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I move that Bill 79, an act to amend Chapter 19 of the Acts of 2006, the Property Valuation Services Corporate Act, now be read a third time and do pass. Uh, Mr. Speaker, the Property Valuation Services Corporation has requested amendments to the Property Valuation Services Corporation Act to allow Property Valuation Services, or PVSC, to modernize its governance structure. PVSC, which was created in 2008, is an independent, not-for-profit corporation which assesses every property in Nova Scotia. These legislative amendments will result in a smaller board, increase the length of membership for greater continuity, and allow for the establishment of a board recruitment committee. Mr. Speaker, PVSC believes these changes will better support its operations and help them better serve the people of Nova Scotia. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Sackville Beaverbank. Uh, yeah, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. We don't really have a, a whole lot to say negative about this. We uh, we do support this bill, and uh, we do recognize that uh, PVSC uh, is requesting this. We heard that clearly at uh, the uh, fall session of uh, UNSM when they made a presentation, and, and we'll support this. Thank you. And recognize the Honourable Minister of Municipal Affairs. It will be the closed third reading of Bill Number 79, the Property Valuation Services Corporation Act. The Honourable Minister of Municipal Affairs. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and uh, I'll just conclude by thanking the member opposite uh, from Sackville Beaverbank for his um, comments and uh, the support of the House for this. Uh, uh, this is in partnership uh, with uh, PVSC, and I also believe that this will help strengthen their board and provide uh, greater continuity. So, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Motion is for third reading of Bill Number 79. The Property Valuation Services Corporation Act. Would all those in favour of the motion please say aye. aye. Contrary minded, nay. Motion is carried. Bill number 79, an act to amend Chapter 19 of the Acts of 2006, the Property Valuation Services Corporation Act. Ordered that the bill do pass and the title be as read by the clerk. Ordered that the bill be engrossed. The Honourable Deputy Government House Leader. 82. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, will you please call Bill number 82? We'll now call Bill number 82, the Halifax Regional Municipality Charter respecting a district energy system. The Honourable Minister of Municipal Affairs. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I move that Bill 82 uh, be now read a third time and do pass. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I'd like to say again that the government is bringing these charter amendments forward at the request of the Halifax Regional Municipality to allow for a mandatory hookup to a district energy system in the Cogswell redevelopment area. Uh, HRM is contemplating creating a system that uses waste energy in the form of steam from Halifax Water's nearby wastewater facility. These systems can supply heating and cooling to multiple buildings from either a centralized plant or several interconnected and distributed plants. The district energy system in Cogswell is projected to lead to a decrease in greenhouse gas emissions by using waste energy to generate heat and cooling for buildings. Mr. Speaker, the district energy system can be found in Nova Scotia, across Canada, and internationally, and are generally successful in areas of high density. These changes reflect the strategic priorities for healthy, livable communities and social development and support the Community Energy Plan. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Sackville Beaverbank. Uh, yeah, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and uh, the PC Caucus will be supporting uh, this one as well. I do want to state for the record, though, that uh, during law amendments, there was an amendment brought forward. Uh, of course, the uh, 
the Halifax uh, Water Commission will be responsible in this case for administering the bills as well as uh, uh, looking after most of this project and uh, we our caucus did bring forward amendments during law amendments to try to uh, hold the Halifax Regional uh, Water Commission a little bit more accountable by forcing them or at least getting them to follow similar rules that are laid out in the MGA Act that municipalities across the province have to follow and uh, that is to have their uh, regular board meetings and general public. Unfortunately, uh, that amendment did not pass through law amendments and uh, I do want to state for the record that uh, that's unfortunate. We uh, as a caucus do feel that public accountability is important and we would have liked to have seen that gone forward and uh, we're sorry that that's not but other than that we do recognize that this is a unique and uh, unique initiative and uh, I certainly want to take an opportunity to thank uh, the HRM solicitor John Traves who did come forward to law amendments and uh, did uh, talk about this and uh, certainly highlighted some of the benefits to this and um, I, I felt that uh, him coming was very advantageous to law amendments and it was a pleasure to hear what he had to say. So uh, with that we will be supporting this. Thank you. The Honourable House Leader for the New Democratic Party. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, we too uh, support uh, this uh, this piece of legislation, uh, Mr. Speaker. It's important that uh, we uh, have an opportunity within our province, especially in HRM, uh, for development to use a district energy uh, kind of system, Mr. Speaker. And I know this amendment to uh, the uh, municipal charter is dealing with. Uh, uh, dealing with one uh, one project specifically around the Cogswell interchange, um, we hope that this opportunity uh, for other projects will be the norm. And uh, if there's a way of ensuring the municipalities can do that without having to come to uh, the floor of this legislature uh, to change the uh, the charter, then maybe that's an option sh we should be looking at. I, I want to concur with the. Uh, the comments from the previous speaker. One of the uh, one of the top issues in my office when it comes to municipal issues uh, dealing with is dealing with uh, the water commission and the concern that residents have about really f not having a say, not knowing what's going on. Uh, so there needs to be work on there, and I hope the minister uh, of uh, municipal affairs recognizes that uh, that uh, we've for a number of years now have left it up to the municipality to try to. Uh, deal with this. Uh, at times the municipality says it's the province that has to mandate it. The province says no, the municipality can do it. Uh, there needs to be some leadership on it and uh, I think the province needs to show that leadership, Mr. Speaker. So we do support uh, Bill uh, 82. I recognize the Honourable Minister of Municipal Affairs will be to close third reading of Bill Number 82, the Halifax Regional Municipality Charter respecting a district energy system. The Honourable Minister of Municipal Affairs. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank both my colleagues for their comments. Uh, I'll just conclude by saying that we we want there, this has been a, a discussion that we were having. We had a bit during estimates in regards to the process of continuously coming back to the legislature looking for approval. So that's something that we're working on as we revise not only the. Uh, HRM charter, but we look at other charters for the CBRM across yeah. and, and across um, all the municipal units. Yeah. So, Mr. Sp <laughs> so, Mr. Speaker, uh, thank, thanks uh, to all the work involved with this file uh, and this uh, legislation, and thanks to both my colleagues for the comments. The motion is for third reading of Bill Number 82, the Halifax Regional Municipality Charter respecting a district energy system. Would all those in favour of the motion please say aye? aye. Contrary-minded, nay. The motion is carried. Bill number 82, an act to amend chapter 39 of the Acts of 2008, the Halifax Regional Municipality Charter, respecting a district energy system. Ordered that the bill do pass and the title be as read by the clerk. Ordered that the bill be engrossed. The Honourable Government House Leader. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Would you please call bill number 84, Halifax Regional Municipality Charter, respecting bonus zoning. We'll now call bill number 84, the Halifax Regional Municipality Charter, respecting bonus zoning. 
The Honourable Minister of Municipal Affairs. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I move that Bill 84, amendments to the Halifax Regional Municipality Charter respecting bonus zoning, be now read a third time and do pass. Uh, government is bringing in these charter amendments. Uh, government is bringing these charter amendments forward at the request of the Halifax Regional Municipality to allow for bonus zoning in all areas of the municipality as part of its municipal planning process. Incentive for bonus zoning is a planning tool that allows municipalities to increase the size of a development in exchange. For for community benefits such as sustainable buildings, affordable housing, more green space, or streetscaping improvements. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, currently HRM can only use incentive or bonus zoning in designated parts of the municipality. This change will allow HRM to consider smart growth and development throughout the municipality. Currently, all other municipalities in Nova Scotia are permitted to use bonus zoning anywhere within their borders. These amendments will ensure that the Halifax Regional Municipality has the same opportunity for its citizens. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I look forward to the comments from my colleagues. The Honourable Member for Sackville Beaverbank. Uh, yeah, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I wish we could say three for three today, but uh, with this particular one, I guess we're not going to get that. Uh, Mr. Speaker, our, uh, our caucus currently is not supporting this, and, and there's a number of reasons for it. Um, you know, I think that... Uh, the bonus zoning, what's being asked for here today, will trump what local or what local MPSs and bylaws already establish. And although there does have to be a public hearing uh, uh, process here, uh, council does not have to listen to that public hearing process. Uh, there's a reason why this, uh, when when uh, Halifax Regional Municipality did their regional plan and their subsequent their RP5 plan, uh, there. There was a, a significant public consultation at that time, both those times, and uh, there was a reason why uh, this didn't come forward at that time. Um, you know, I have reached out recently to uh, a number of my former colleagues on council and have asked them whether or not they are familiar with this uh, request coming forward and uh, the two that I spoke with both said that they were not. Um, so that uh, raises some concerns to me. Um, I also I, I am concerned by uh, what the implications of this would be to uh, suburban and, and more suburban parts of uh, HRM than anything. Uh, as uh, the minister did uh, recognize this is allowed currently in the center plan and downtown areas I think that's where it should be uh, I also want to say that you know I, I have continued to hear time and again and I use during first reading I use this analogy of the uh, the donkey and the carrot and that carrot in this case being uh, affordable housing it became very clear when the HRM solicitor uh, attended law amendments I, I did come right out and ask him in what case previous case has bonus uh, zoning ever seen an increase in affordable housing in HRM and the answer was it never has. Um, I would highlight for members that the one time that it has recently come forward, which is uh, in a current development that's being reviewed, which is the Quimple Road uh, uh, tower that's being reviewed there, although the life expectancy of that tower would probably exceed 50 years, I do believe that there is a, only a short period of time that would be recognized that the developer would have to have affordable housing. I think it's a 10-year window there that the developer would have to to, to uh, provide a, an affordable housing uh, component. So even at that, Mr. Speaker, this is not a long-term fix to affordable housing. Um, you know, I did say during uh, during our uh, first. Uh, during the first time that uh, this was read before the House, I did say at that time that I do believe that this fundamentally benefits developers and it will uh, benefit the municipality in respects to the fact that uh, they gain their money through assessment and the more density, the more assessment they'll have, the more money they'll get. So I do not feel that this is in the best interest of uh, communities and of the public at large and, uh, you know, as I said, 
uh, just a minute ago. Although there is a uh, requirement for a component of uh, public information meeting or, or public hearing to uh, be held, councils not held that they have to follow what they hear there. Uh, they can have a public hearing, listen for four hours, and at the end of it still vote against what the public is. So, um, so based on some of those reasons, uh, we won't be uh, be looking at or we won't be supporting this at this time. And uh, I do feel that there will be an opportunity for the municipality to have this reviewed when they do their RP10, which is coming up in another two years. So thank you. I'm recognized the Honourable Minister of Municipal Affairs. It will be to close third reading of Bill Number 84, the Halifax Regional Municipality Charter respecting bonus zoning. The Honourable Minister of Municipal Affairs. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, uh, and, and I'll be brief. Just thank my uh, colleague for the comments. Uh, we always strive to work with our municipal partners to, to develop and design legislation that they feel is supportive of their communities and that uh, is uh, transparent with the public. So uh, in this case, uh, how this is a request of HRM Council, and again, this is something that uh, uh, usually you, you hear the opposite, where, where there's some restrictions across the province, but uh, every other municipal unit Unit has the ability to do this across their municipal borders and, and Halifax is looking for the same. So I'm happy to stand here uh, and again thank our municipal partners and the HRM uh, staff and council uh, for helping us design this legislation. Thank you. The motion is for third reading of bill number 84, the Halifax Regional Municipality Charter respecting bonus zoning. Would all those in favour of the motion please say aye. aye. Contrary minded nay. nay. Motion is carried. Bill number 84, an act to amend chapter 39 of the Acts of 2008, the Halifax Regional Municipality Charter, respecting bonus zoning. Ordered that the bill do pass and the title be as read by the clerk. Ordered that the bill be engrossed. The Honourable Government House Leader. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Could you please call bill number 87, Fisheries and Coastal Resources Act. Now call bill number 87, the Fisheries and Coastal Resources Act. The Honourable Minister of Fisheries and Aquaculture. Thank you, Mr. Spooker, Speaker. I do move that Bill Number 87, Fisheries and Coastal Resources Act, now be read for the third time, and it does pass. I'll check into that to see if that's a parliamentary term or not. The Honourable Member for Kings North. Thank you, Mr. Spooker. <laughs> now look Mr. what you've done. Pardon see? Me. <laughs> Uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, as I mentioned in uh, committee of the whole house, uh, there's parts of this bill that realize that the industry needs are very good parts of this uh, bill, and there are parts of this bill that we have some concerns about. So uh, we recognize that uh, the opportunity to have institutional licenses and research going forward is a very positive uh, step, and uh, that's in the uh, bill. Uh, we realize that there is uh, the uh, Amalgamation of licenses will be very helpful for the industry. It's also a positive step in this bill. We realize that the uh, clarifying the process around the 30-day appeal is a positive step in the bill. However, as I mentioned in set committee of the whole house, I want to get on the record again that I have very grave concerns about the amount of power this puts in the hands of the Minister of uh, Fisheries and Aquaculture in terms of being the gatekeeper on which which uh, applications go forward to the uh, Aquaculture Review Board. The Minister appoints the Aquaculture Review Board anyway. Uh, in the past, it was an administrator that, again, is appointed by the uh, uh, Minister to, uh, to make this decision. And we believe, we brought in some amendments, we believe that uh, this puts too, simply puts too much power in the hands of the Minister of uh, Fisheries and Aquaculture, and I stated it in Committee of the Whole House, I'll state it here on the record. We believe there's evidence for that, and this is a matter of public record. It's been discussed before in this House and been in the media that during the May 2017 election, the Minister had an, a number of campaign donations from significant people in the aquaculture industry around the province, and I recognize that the Minister said he wasn't aware who, uh, who donated to his campaign during that time and uh, we know that the minister is one of the longest serving and uh, most uh, ministers so I'll leave that to you to decide whether he was aware of that or not I don't know the answer to that um, but anyway we're, we're concerned about this provision we realized one of the aspects of that was to uh, allow uh, 
uh, to give a period of time for applications to have uh, before the Agriculture Review Board so someone else couldn't jump the queue. We believe there's other ways that could, that could be solved. So for, because of our concerns about that aspect of the bill, our caucus does not plan to support this bill. I recognize the Honourable Minister of Fisheries and Aquaculture. It will be to close third reading of Bill Number 87, the Fisheries and Coastal Resources Act. The Honourable Minister of Fisheries and Aquaculture. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I do move uh, Bill 87. Motion is for third reading of Bill Number 87, the Fisheries and Coastal Resources Act. Would all those in favour of the motion please say aye? Aye. Contrary minded, nay. The motion is carried. Bill number 87, an act to amend chapter 25 of the Acts of 1996, the Fisheries and Coastal Resources Act. Ordered that the bill do pass and the title be as read by the clerk. Ordered that the bill be engrossed. The Honourable Government House Leader. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Would you please call Bill number 104, the Research Nova Scotia Corporation Act. We'll now call Bill number 104, the Research Nova Scotia Corporation Act. The Honourable Minister of Labour and Advanced Education. Mr. Speaker, I move that Bill number 104, Research Nova Scotia Corporation Act, be now read a third time and do pass. The Honourable Member for Northside, Westmount. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And Mr. Speaker, the Research Nova Scotia Foundation Act is, is probably a good thing as far as making sure that stable funding is available for certain research in the province at any given time. The only concern we have with the bill is that the Nova Scotia Health Research Foundation maintain the funding it gets because of the good work it does, what it provides to health care in the province, brings in people to do research in the province, keeps good doctors here to do research. Um, so we just want to make sure, and we'll be watching to make sure that the funding for research uh, in healthcare continues to be uh, there and or grow to continue the good work that the Nova Scotia Health Research Foundation is doing at the present. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable House Leader for the New, <coughs> for the new Democratic Party. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Glad to uh, stand for a moment to speak on Bill 104. Uh, I know uh, our caucus supports immensely uh, the capability of research being done here in Nova Scotia. Uh, we know how important it is for many services that Nova Scotians have, but just by the sheer uh, spin-offs that research can provide, uh, not only economic, uh, but what the findings of that research does, Mr. Speaker. It's extremely important on health care and on many other many other fronts and we know over the last uh, decade or so especially on the federal level Mr. Speaker that uh, research and development has been uh, somewhat under attack by the federal government uh, the previous federal government under Stephen Harper and uh, I know that a lot of work needs to be done to repair and uh, replace some of the loss uh, capacity that we have not only in Nova Scotia but across across Canada we did try to move an amendment that would uh, support uh, and recognizing the Health Research Foundation of Nova Scotia here, uh, Mr. Speaker, and the important work that they do. Uh, I know I've turned to them many times over my career over the last uh, 15 years or so in the Nova Scotia Legislature. They've always shown uh, a professionalism uh, not in a non-partisan way to make sure that we were properly informed. If it was a policy we wanted to move on, if it was an initiative that we wanted to support, uh, they were there uh, for to support us. And and there was never a question of no, uh, you're a political party. There were no research and making sure that policy uh, is founded on on good research uh, is uh, is a key, and uh, that's why we wanted to make sure that they were protected. I hope I hope the government is genuine in, in their uh, in their comments around the uh, Health Research Foundation here in Nova Scotia that the funding that they've been receiving and the support that they've been receiving won't be siphoned off into other avenues and other areas, Mr. Speaker, uh, because we do not want to see that. Uh, so we do support the bill, uh, but we are uh, we are concerned uh, that. Uh, the viability of the Health Research Foundation uh, continues to play the important role that I just uh, outlined, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. If I recognize the Honourable Minister of Labour and Advanced Education, it will be to close third reading of Bill Number 104, the Research Nova Scotia Corporation Act. The Honourable Minister of Labour and Advanced Education. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to thank the members for their uh, questions and feedback. Mr. Speaker, I'm in complete agreement. Nova Scotia Health Research has done tremendous work, and I look forward to the incredible work they're going to do under the new uh, research umbrella. Um, Mr. Speaker, I can uh, pass uh, through you to the House that uh, all the employees of Nova Scotia Health Research are going to be part of the new organization. Krista Connell is retiring. I want to thank her for her service. She's been incredible as the head of the organization. 
I've uh, got to meet her uh, before I ran for politics back in 2012, and uh, she does incredible work, and it's no surprise the member from uh, Sackville Cobbequid has had a great experience with the organization. Uh, Mr. Speaker, one thing I'd also like to point out, um, this here organization is going to be receiving more funding. In the last uh, 15 months alone, $45 million extra has gone into uh, research in the past two budgets. Uh, within this budget, the, 10 million that, uh, the $20 million that went in as an increase, $10 million of it is earmarked specifically for health research. And if you actually look at uh, Nova Scotia Health Research budget, I forget the exact amount. It was between, uh, I believe, three and five million a year. That uh, money will continue, as well as the additional money when government has capacity to uh, input into research. The money is being leveraged, and uh, as the member from Sackville Cobbock would mention, and I look forward to all the great outcomes that we will have from the research happening in the province. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The motion is for third reading of Bill Number 104, the Research Nova Scotia Corporation Act. Would all those in favour of the motion please say aye. Aye. Contrary minded, nay. The motion is carried. Bill Number 104, an act to establish the Research Nova Scotia Corporation. Ordered that the bill do pass and the title be as read by the clerk. Ordered that the bill be engrossed. The Honourable Government House Leader. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Would you please call Bill Number 106, the Insurance Act. We'll now call Bill Number 106, the Insurance Act. The Honourable Minister of Finance. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I move that Bill 106, the Insurance Act, be now read a third time and do pass. I would like to thank members opposite for their support for this bill when it was uh, introduced. The amendments uh, contained in Bill 106 help protect innocent and vulnerable Nova Scotians. The amendments are of particular importance to women who are disproportionately affected by domestic violence and abuse. Question? The motion is for third reading of Bill Number 106, the Insurance Act. Would all those in favour of the motion please say aye? Aye. Contrary minded, nay. The motion is carried. Bill Number 106, an act to amend Chapter 231 of the Revised Statutes 1989, the Insurance Act. Ordered that the bill do pass and the title be as read by the clerk. Ordered that the bill be engrossed. The Honourable Government House Leader. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And last but certainly not least, would you please call private, mil private members' bills for third reading? We'll now call private members' bills for third reading. Would you please call Bill Number 66, the Volunteer Services Act? We'll now call Bill Number 66, the Volunteer Services Act. The Honourable Member for Victoria the Lakes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, I move that Bill 66 be read for a third time. I'm pleased to rise, Mr. Speaker, and speak very briefly on Bill 66. This bill, Mr. Speaker, relieves any liability to individuals or organizations when an AED, an automatic external defibrillator, is used, unless there is misconduct or negligence on the individual's part or maintenance on the organization's part. Mr. Speaker, AEDs save lives, and by removing any concern, we hope to see more in communities throughout the province. So I look forward to any discussion that follows. Thank you. The Honourable House Leader for the New Democratic Party. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, and uh, I'm very pleased to stand on Bill uh, 66, uh, the Volunteer Service Act. I want to I want to uh, thank the member uh, for bringing this bill forward. It touches uh, on a very important. Um, issue and concern in, in our communities across Nova Scotia and whatever we can do uh, to put at ease uh, Nova Scotians who might see those uh, automatic external defibrillators in, in shopping malls, in office towers, in public spaces, Mr. Speaker, that they're not intimidated and they don't hesitate uh, to act when someone may be uh, in uh, cardiac arrest, Mr. Speaker. So I want to thank the member for bringing this forward and encourage all Nova Scotians uh, to uh, don't shy away. Way. Learn about uh, what those uh, ex uh, automated external defibrillators do. Uh, they can save lives, Mr. Speaker, and, and time is of the essence when someone uh, is uh, in, a car in a cardiac arrest situation, and, and I, uh, I hope Nova Scotia to recognize that they should jump in and, and hopefully play a role in saving that person's life. So thank you, Mr. Speaker. 
The Honourable Member for Kings West. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and uh, pleased uh, to uh, support, uh, obviously, uh, Bill 66, and thank uh, the member for Victoria Lakes uh, uh, for uh, bringing this uh, uh, advancement of uh, AED use in our province. I think this is what uh, it is designed to do, uh, that uh, we don't shy away uh, from, uh, from, the, from the AED instrument, as it is life-saving, and, uh, and more and more uh, places in our community uh, have AEDs, and the goal, of course, is to get them in all places where there are uh, many people congregating in our communities. Uh, uh, so this is a valuable addition to the, to the legislation, and I uh, thank the member uh, for his uh, sincere uh, desire to make a difference uh, in the use of AEDs in our province. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I recognize the Honourable Member for Victoria the Lakes will be to close third reading of Bill Number 66, the Volunteer Services Act. The Honourable Member for Victoria the Lakes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I want to thank the government and members on both sides of the House for enabling this bill to proceed to where it is today. We've already, uh, members have already spoken of the benefit of having AEDs in communities. But in order for an AED to be effective, they need to be registered. So I'm going to, uh, before I close, encourage people to register their AED with Health Services Nova Scotia because it could save a lot of lives. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The motion is for third reading of Bill Number 66, the Volunteer Services Act. Would all those in favor of the motion please say aye. Aye. Contrary minded, nay. <laughs> The motion is carried. Bill number 66, an act to amend chapter 497 of the revised statutes 1989, the Volunteer Services Act. Ordered that the bill do pass and the title be as read by the clerk. Ordered that the bill be engrossed. The Honorable Government House Leader. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. That concludes government business for today. I move that the House do now rise to meet again Tuesday, April 17th, 2018, between 1 p.m. and 11.59 p.m. Following the daily routine and question period, we will move to third reading for public bills 65, 99, 107, 108, 114, 116, and 118, as well as private member bill for third reading number 52. Motion is for the House to adjourn to rise again Tuesday, April 17th, between the hours of 1 p.m. and 11.59 p.m. Would all those in favor of the motion please say aye. Aye. Contrary minded, nay. The motion is carried. Uh, House now stand adjourned until Tuesday, April 17th at 1 p.m.